Angela Weber is like a two bit songwriter. Yeah. Who That's what kind I of thought. found his way into musical theater because yeah. no one was doing rock musicals after hair. So it was kind of like he he was at the right place at the right time, but he was never really good as far as I'm concerned. Sure. I'm really I've never really said I mean he did cats, right? He did cats. All of them are like the yeah, longest Phantom. run. But they're all like the longest running musicals in the history of musical theater. So and if you think about uh, some of the most popular movies. Right now, Andrew Lloyd Webber's like, in your motherfucking face, hey, BV. He's got millions of dollars <laughs> and he's a knight. Okay. He's a knight? Fuck yeah, dude. He's Sir Andrew yeah, but Lloyd Webber. You're, you're a baron. I, <laughs> and I was born a baron. Born okay? a baron. He had to work his way up into becoming a knight <laughs> with his bullshit. Oh my god, I love that so much. I love that so much. That's such a weird count too. It's not like it's we me and my friend Toll tried to time that out and it is so fucking interesting. What they did, the song is Hit It and Quit It by Funkadelic from their 1971 acid rock masterpiece, Maggot Brain. It's also number 479 out of 500 on the 500 with Josh Adam Myers. What's up, everybody? It's me, the King of Fleece. I'm here as the King of Fleece, and I'm giving love to you. This is the only podcast, guys, probably the only one in the whole world that's going through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the top 500 albums, and uh, I'm having a great time doing it, and I know you guys are having a great time listening. Thank you for making this one of the best experiences of my life, and thank you also to everybody that is doing the Instagram stories. So I want you to keep doing it. This is all it is. Take a screenshot of how you're listening to the 500. And I want you to go to Instagram stories, put that picture of how you're listening to it on Instagram stories, tag me at Josh Adam Myers and hashtag the 500 podcast. And why don't you go ahead and put a hashtag fleece army in there? Give me a 24 hour ad. I'm trying to get the word out. And this is a way for you and your friends to like join in and be like, fuck yeah, dude, what is this podcast? And you're like, dude, it's the 500. The guy, so the guy wears a lot of fleece, and uh, he, he calls us the Fleece Army, and we're going through the greatest recorded music in the history of mankind. So join in, and they're like, well, I want to do it. And then you go, well, fuck yeah. Here's the new one. It's Maggot Brain. That's the album we're breaking down. And my guest today is stand-up comic and actor Baron Vaughn. You guys know him from playing Nwabadike Bergstein on Grace and Frankie on Netflix. He also is Tom Servo on Mystery Science Theater 3000 on Netflix. He's a hilarious comic. He's also host of The New Negroes coming on Comedy Central on April 19th. Love him to death. Very, very good friend of mine. And it was so much fun to sit down and get to know him. Because this is an important album, guys. Maggot Brain is something else. I was not expecting this record to be as rock and rollish. Not only is this the bridge between Motown's darker, psychedelic direction of the late 60s and early 70s and Detroit's acid rock proto-punk scene, but you can hear the influence and the key elements of funk and soul in the mix. And you could definitely hear it in some bands like Bad Brains, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Fishbone, Living Color, Chumba Wamba, Hanson, Nelson, Mandela, and the regular Nelson. Don't forget, guys, to listen to the end of the podcast where we're going to spotlight a new artist that was directly influenced by Funkadelic. Also, rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the 500 on your platform of your choosing. Follow me on social media, guys. I'm almost at 10,000 on Instagram. I really want to do it. So, dude, if you're listening to this podcast, you're in fucking Belgium. If you're listening to this podcast and you're in France, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in Cincinnati, Ohio, go on your social and follow me. I need followers, man. I got to show my mom that I'm doing something. 
And my mom is is a is an influencer. That would be so weird if my mom was an influencer. Just this old Jewish woman. No, guys. This is you gotta buy the fit tea. Buy fit tea from me. It's me, Sharon Myers. Hashtag ad. Rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the 500. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com. Send me an email, guys. Tell me that you're digging it. Tell me what you don't like. I know that you, some of you don't like this, so fucking tell me, and I'll figure out how to fix it. Or just say, Josh, I love the podcast. That's all you got to do. That's all I want. For all things 500, go to our website, the500podcast.com. So I guess that's it, man. Nothing else to do, but here we go with number 479 out of 500 with Maggot Brain by Funko Deli. Baron Von a Baron Baron Von Baron Von a Baron Baron Von Baron Von Baron Von Baron Von a Baron Baron Von. Thank you for the company, man. That was people are as I keep doing this. People keep adding more and more. Like people just go ah, or just people join in, but. It's so funny to finally be able to get to sit down and talk to you about this record because uh, the second I brought it up to you, Baron, mm-hmm. you said, oh, I own it on vinyl. I own it on vinyl. I probably have texted you that 80 million times. Uh, 80 million times. <laughs> and then you kept saying, uh, oh, dude, I'm bringing it. I'm going to bring the vinyl. I'm going to bring the like, This was like a, like a badge of honor for you. Is that, I, 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 oh, this? You mean maggot brain? Yeah. I own this on uh, vinyl. I own it on vinyl. On vinyl and listen to it on my uh, fucking 1930s record player because that's how we do it. That's how we do it. So let me ask you this. My what, gramophone. <laughs> what is your history with music? Is that off air you were saying you are proud of the fact that you listen to weird music? Let's explain that. Um, well, you know, actually, um, even the beatboxing. Like, I've been beatboxing for a long, long time. I probably started, I know that I started in the late 80s because I started beatboxing because of the song Bad by Michael Jackson. Because when I was a kid, I loved that song, yeah. and we did not have a radio, we did not have a tape player, and I'm like, how can I listen to the song I like when that's not on TV, Wait, on how MTV? Did you, how did you not have a radio or a tape player? You're just, did you grow up just like very impoverished? Or like- um, I grew up in a small town, in a very, very small town in uh, New Mexico called Tucumcari. And so I had the, it was my great grandparents that raised me for a little bit. Until my mom came and got me when she got out of college. Long story. We'll get into some of it. <laughs> Perfect. I bet there's some questions that will that'll bring that shit up. Exactly. So we didn't. I as a kid, kid, like you know, I don't think they had a record player. They had a TV, but we didn't have a like a you know a cassette player or anything like that. That that stuff I didn't get really in my life until I was in middle school and living in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is where I mainly grew up. Yeah. So. We had MTV. I remember watching MTV at the beginning of MTV because it was like the early 80s and stuff. But uh, yeah, we didn't have that stuff. So I just like tried to figure out how to make the the song, try to do the drums of bad myself. Oh, wow. And I kind of figured out that I could make on my own. I was very young that I could make sounds at the front of my mouth at the same time as sounds in the back of my throat. And that if I could, I could kind of do them differently. So I could be like I'd be I would be practicing be like and then in my mouth I go because it was kind of a it's like it's really fast yeah yeah, yeah. it's I, you're hitting it on the yeah, nose so it's like, so. that's what I was doing mostly as a five year old <laughs> walking around so but you, so that means that you've yeah. had like music just inside of you in a sense like you just have that. That <clears throat> I don't know that people like my drummer from the goddamn comedy gym just calls it the feel. It's just music mm. touches you and then you understand it. And so it doesn't make a difference if you've studied it or not. You just understand this is where I come in. This is the the eight count and you can just find, you know what I yes. mean? It's just you have yes. like rhythm. Well, and I, I, you know, in that little small town, I was part of a church community and, um, you know, gospel and, and hymns is a huge part of that yeah. community. So it was like I was singing a lot of those songs as a young person, hearing them in church, hearing live music basically multiple times a week. 
you know, sung in a, a place that had such incredible acoustics. So I could hear, I heard what a choir could sound like. Church together. acoustics? Church, church acoustics. <laughs> That's, those are the best acoustics. Church acoustics. And then, uh, and then watching MTV, loving Michael Jackson, loving Prince, and kind of coming up with a lot of that stuff. And then moving to Vegas, there was a little bit more of me listening to hip hop. By the, I mean, I was listening to early hip hop too. I was listening to like the message. I remember when that came out. Oh wow! How old are you, by the way? I am thirty eight. You're thirty. You're my age. I'm right, well, yeah. thirty nine. But yeah. So the message, and and then did that evolve into like a tribe called Quest? And well, the message. It kind of. I kind of stuck with the message of Melly Mel, and then it was Run DMC, and then it was Public Enemy. Yeah. And so, tribe. A lot of these. A lot of the stuff that was sort of the, if you will, more intellectual, more intelligent hip hop of the like late eighties, early nineties. I didn't come to until later. Because no one I knew was listening to that at all. That actually was a big reason. There's a lot of music that I loved that I wish I kept listening to. Yeah. Because now I understand like, oh, this is the this is some of the best stuff that ever happened. But I just put it away because no one I knew was listening to Tribe. No one I knew was listening to like, I'm trying to think of other people, like Wu-Tang Clan. No one I knew was really listening to that. Yeah. No one I knew was really listening to, I'm trying to think of other people. Do you know who uh, uh, J. Ru the Damager is? Oh, yeah, dude. Is it Damaja or Damaja? <laughs> Damaja. I like Damaja. Damaja. I never Damaja. heard it like that. <laughs> but it's like, I remember that album coming out. I remember... Bone Thugs. Bone Thugs was, since they were mainstream. Yeah. Because I was in Vegas, which is the West Coast. So, of course, people were listening to Tupac. People were listening to uh, Dr. Dre. I heard The Chronic. I mean, not The Chronic, but N.W.A. pretty young. Yeah. Uh, Straight out of Compton and that, that whole album and stuff like that. I didn't hear Easy e by himself first. But I remember hearing, like, N.W.A., and stuff like that in like seventh grade, maybe early elementary school, or whenever the heck it was happening. And of course, hearing the radio and hearing hip hop on the radio. So it was like, and then I also kept with Michael Jackson and Prince's careers, which led me into Quincy Jones kind of territory. Okay. And all the stuff that he did and all the different people that he produced that I loved. Uh, especially because it's like my favorite genre, I guess. I mean, I love music where people are playing instruments. And so the post funk. Post disco, pre R and B era, I'm talking about like kind of that yeah, late some, '80s, early '90s. Hit me with some bands because I might be a little confused at what that is. Well, I'm thinking about like uh, Cool in the Gang. Ah, I'm thinking about like the okay. Gap Band, Zapp yeah. and Roger, um, you know, stuff like that era. Um, Sh- um, Shirelle. Don't know Shirelle, but Shirelle. You know that sounds song, fantastic. You know that song, Saturday Love. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, love. No, not at all. I don't. Great song. (laughs) Is it on this list? Because I'm excited. Not on this list. (laughs) Um, And then, of course, there was Prince and there's The Time. And then there's like all these different bands that kind of had this post-funk sound. But then the production was, because remember the production, like early 90s, everything was so uh, reverby. Yeah. It was so much reverb. And then watching movies like Kid and Play, watching things like In Living Color, one of my most influential comedy uh, things is uh, a little known special series of specials called Robert Townsend Partners in Crime. Oh, I, I think I do remember that. I mean, I, we like we were me and my buddy uh, were talking about Hollywood Shuffle the other day. Yeah. So I mean, that's one of my favorite movies. It's a fantastic movie. Still yeah. holds up too. Yeah. Um. So in that vein, I think this was after Hollywood Shuffle that Robert Townsend kind of had a, a maybe three or four different HBO specials. I think I remember those. Yeah. That he hosted, and he would have comedians. So then that was me first seeing people like Tommy Davidson and David Allen Greer, Robin Harris, and then uh, then he would have musicians. Hammer, before You Can't Touch This, and other people. I can't even remember. Back then it was just, you can touch this. Bat. It was, it was um, <laughs> you can you touch can this. You can touch this. No, it was um, <laughs> Hammer Don't Hurt Him. I remember that. Turn this mother out. We're going to turn this mother out. <laughs> yeah. It's hammer. <laughs> hammer. Yeah, that whole thing. Yes. None of this is weird, though. Not you, yet. You said, okay, so where did it turn? Where it turned is high school. Ah. So I was listening to all this stuff. I was listening We're to- We're living on the edge. You can't help yourself from fun. Um, listen to that shit because this I was watching be MTV. One. So I was listening to Aerosmith. I was listening to all that stuff, you know, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all that stuff that was yeah. coming out. Um, I mean, Aerosmith is before them. But it's also like Genesis. I loved Genesis. Sure. Um, I loved Peter Gabriel's solo work. Okay. So even it's Phil Collins' Genesis. 
Yeah, I, no, that's yeah. That's, Michael well, that's, McDonald, Doobie Brothers, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> None of this is weird. This is just. And then I went to a performing arts high school in Las there Vegas, Nevada. There it is. And then I was a freshman in a world where people were speaking about musical theater in a way I didn't even know musical theater existed. Right? Mm. No one I knew was talking about that at all. Any of the kids I knew, we were all listening to. Dre, Snoop, Tupac, you know, all the standards, if you will. Yeah. Biggie, you know, just ev- Queen Latifah, just everything that was like, you and I, T-Y. You got to let them know. You and I, T-Y. That's, that's a unity. unity. So it's like I was taking in influences from Martin, from Living Single, sure. from uh, In Living Color. Uh, the Robert Townsend specials are pre-Deaf Comedy Jam. Okay. And then Deaf Comedy Jam came out, of course, and I was watching the, the fuck out of that. So... Suddenly, I was a freshman in a high school where seniors were talking about musicals, and I did not know anything about them. So I was like, I got to educate myself. I got to, if I'm going to keep up with the popular kids sure. here, I got to educate myself about musical theater. And then so I started like checking out CDs from the library and like listening to them. Stuff that I had heard, like Les Miserables. Ah. Les Mis, or for short, Miss Saigon. Uh, Angela Weber is like a two bit songwriter. Yeah. Who That's what kind I of thought. found his way into musical theater because yeah. no one was doing rock musicals after Hair, so it was kind of like he he was at the right place at the right time, but he was never really good as far as I'm concerned. Sure, and all of his musicals kind of suck as far as I'm concerned. I'm really I've never really said. I mean, he did Cats, right? He did Cats. All he of did, them are like the yeah, longest, run, but they're all like the longest running musicals in the history of musical theater. So and if you think about uh, some of the most popular movies. Right now, Andrew Lloyd Webber's like, in your motherfucking face, hey, BV. He's got millions of dollars <laughs> and he's a knight. Okay. He's a knight? Fuck yeah, dude. He's Sir Andrew yeah, but Lloyd you're, Webber. you're a baron. I, <laughs> and I was born a baron. Born okay? a baron. He had to work his way up to becoming a knight. With his bullshit. <laughs> um, so then suddenly I, I liked all these musicals and like Stephen Sondheim and like Sweeney Todd yeah. and hearing all this stuff. And so, and then I started to try to find the music that was the bridge, if you will, because I liked the theatricality of musicals, especially as a person who was a young actor and I liked being on stage and I liked being loud and I liked singing. And then I liked black shit. I liked, you know, I was talking like like Quincy Jones and Prince and Michael Jackson and all this stuff. And then so slowly but surely, and also I started getting interested in in jazz in high school as well because I went to a performing arts high school so there were kids that could actually play instruments. Sure, I I can imagine, yeah. That were like, oh, you got to listen to this. And that's how I kind of stumbled upon Earth, Wind & Fire, Tower of Power, some of the more kind of funk stuff. And then then George Clinton and Funkadelic and Parliament and Parliament Funkadelic and P-Funk and all its iterations. I was aware of him. Because Dre sampled so much of his music. Yeah, I was, you know, what's funny is before you got here, because I've been listening to to the album, uh, which I'll just I'll just say it's it's our album is number four seventy nine out of five hundred. It's the third studio album, Maggot Brain, by Funkadelic, released on July 12, 1971, produced by George Clinton and recorded at Universal Studios in Detroit. So what I I was listening to uh, like the uh, Alexa, I was like, Alexa, play Funkadelic or play Parliament. And they were she was playing just like uh, and like every other song. I was like, that's Dre. That's fucking this. That's that. That's that's you know N W. I just heard so yes, you heard the influence much. Yeah. So tell me about the first time you heard this record. Well, you know, I, before this record, even I heard like you know obviously like Atomic Dog was so ubiquitous, and then Snoop used it when he came out with his own solo album. Yes. You know what's my 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 guy name Snoop Dogg, okay. and I'm like, da- oh, I know that song, Atomic Dog. I I knew Atomic Dog already. Yeah. So. When I came to Maggot Brain was a li- again a little later, so I was aware of a lot of the hits, you know, especially the stuff that was later, like it's me, eighties, nineties, the same. And then Maggot Brain, it wasn't until I became an adult and then I started talk- t- thinking about albums as full pieces of work. So of course, getting into jazz and getting into more sophisticated music, even musical theater, because musical theater is a story. Every single song supports a narrative, so it kind of started making me think about songs as storytelling, you know, instead of just something I can snap my fingers to and sing along to. And really good musicians, obviously, are always telling you something about themselves, about the world, about the environment, in their music, and how they, the order that they put the songs into on an album, especially when this album came out, because this was like, you were, you had to really think about what what do I want this 
people to hear first? Yeah. And what do I want them to hear last? And we, we you know, so you're thinking about like musically how to take people through a journey. You're thinking about it through whatever your lyrics are, whatever the point of a song is, and that all ties together to the the central idea of an album, right? Yeah. So Maggot Brain, I probably a couple years ago, I did a show in Denton, Texas, at a rock venue called Rubber Gloves that no longer exists in Denton, Texas. It was like this really cool little place that was next to train tracks. I mean, a train show in the middle of my show. I got heckled by a train. It was kind of romantic and beautiful out there. And two hours, three hours before the show, I'm at the venue because I don't have anywhere else to go. And whoever the manager was put on, on those big ass speakers, the first song of maggot brain put on maggot brain and i got to hear i heard the voice the poem you know mother earth is pregnant y'all have knocked her up and it made me giggle i was like what what is going on here and i didn't realize i recognized the voice like i didn't know it was george clinton that was talking yeah and then suddenly the the song started and it was like because i feel like the first track is like almost like a it's like a combination of a lullaby but also, in sort of a way, I feel like it's a representation of the Big Bang, in some kind of way. Sure. Where it's like it's got this, this, the, that, that you know, those three chords that are being boom, doom, 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 and then that guitar solo comes out. Play it in the background, Peter, as he's saying this. Just it keep going. It comes out wailing on top of this very simple chord structure, but the passion behind the guitar, the intention behind it, I was like, whoa! And I was just alone in this this venue, hearing this on this great sound system hearing every single detail of it and i was like what the hell is going on and the guy's like oh that's maggot brain and i was like maggot brain he's like yeah funkadelic i'm like this is a funkadelic song that, dude you have the exact same reaction that i had because i was expecting you know maggot brain to skip off a do every day you got the maggot brain that's the get kind of chanty with the maggot brain you know we'll get it all down when we're going insane that's what I, a lot of george clinton music that's like that and i love it just the same it, yeah it's great but dude that's what i was expecting and i put this on and immediately was like this is nothing like I was expecting out of George Clinton. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. might be one of the most fun experiences I've had. Like, because my eyes were just wide yes. open. I had them on the big speakers that I have in the apartment. I was blaring it and was completely blown away. And that's so cool that you had that exact same experience. Yeah, yeah, because you get it again. Like, I think about, like, how this album was intended to be listening to, listened to. You think about back in the day when this album came out, someone went and got it. And then they went home, maybe they had speakers, or maybe there was even a listening booth at the record store, because they had them back then, Yeah, right? I remember that. And you're putting on these hi-fi, you know, uh, headphones, and then you just like, whew, go, just go into this experience, you're like, what is happening right now? And it's like he almost breaks your brain at the front of this whole thing with this, this very almost uh, morose, slow lullaby, but it sounds like there's a birth happening. In a kind of a way. And I, I take that to the poem, since he's talking about Mother Earth is pregnant. Yeah. And I kind of take it like this is the experience of like a, um, a baby growing in the womb and then passing out of the womb at the same time. That's okay. what that first track kind of makes me think of. And then suddenly he's born and it's like, bing, 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 and then, you know, it's, it's uh, can you get to that, the second track? Yeah. And it's like you're, so good. you're suddenly in this experience and... Listening to this album all the way through is just kind of like, I mean, it, it is stylistically, it's like so much variation, so much uh, precision musically. It's it's very, very, I, I mean, I love this album. So that was my first experience hearing it, and then I went and got it, you know, and then listened on vinyl. to the whole thing. On, on vinyl. Because you won't shut the fuck up about it. Go get it, it on vinyl. <laughs> and, then I, uh, and then I listened to the whole thing, and I was like, this is probably my favorite like one of my favorite albums, if not like you know, at least my favorite Funkadelic album, but like, well, probably one of my favorite albums. This of all was time. this was such an experience for me because uh, you, it's it's literally it's acid rock. Yes, it's, it's not funk. This is acid rock. The the first song because if the the it opens with Maggot Brain and then closes with what is that song called Armageddon the world Armageddon yeah we'll get to it but there, it's War of Armageddon or something it's, like that it's, this is there's seven songs on this record two of them being extended musical jams yes. that are basically just these like acid trips but it's but those are just bookending 
pretty groovy and funky, soulful, psychedelic experiences. Yeah. It's and and the, some of the catchiest pop yes. I have ever crunchy grooves heard. And so, as I was listening to this, I was like, this wasn't what I was expecting from a black artist in the early seventies, especially George Clinton. Mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, and if people don't know how we got to being funkadelic George Clinton because I was also saying this what the fuck does George Clinton do on this record like what is he why is he the guy because it's Eddie Hazel it's this person the singer I don't hear George unless he's like talking like I want to get to the bottom of what the fuck George actually does but Mm -hmm. he's this is what I love about George he started a doo-wop group called the parliaments in New Jersey in the late 50s then by the 60s George became a writer for Motown in Detroit and the parliaments had achieved some success okay and so then that inspired, he was inspired by Hendrix Zappa Santana, which I heard yes, in yes. this record in all the 60s acid rock. And then they became Funkadelics. And the Parliaments eventually became Parliament, a soulful pop vocal group. And then George Clinton just combined them together after some legal shit and made Parliament Funkadelic, abbreviated as P Funk. So when I mentioned this, yes. and this is what I love about you, mm-hmm. is that you actually have a show called the new negroes yes which is basically saying we are black comedians but Mm -hmm. we are not the deaf comedy comedians like we're not i mean that's that's like the most simplest say but it's a simplistic kind of way i mean you know the thing about deaf comedy jam is what and what i love about deaf comedy jam is that it became if you will a location for you to experience blackness that's what i'm trying to do with new negroes now new negroes is me stealing a, a a term from like turn of the century Harlem Renaissance stuff like that yeah. but it's standing on this exact same idea in which it was a an idea the new negro movement which the Harlem Renaissance is under the umbrella of the new negro movement it's about black people just speaking you don't have to you all you have to do is exist and tell your story and that in in and of itself is a political act wow because you are redefining what people think you are Standing in your truth, as they say, stuff sure. like that. And so George Clinton and Funkadelic, you know, because I guess it was like he, he couldn't get the rights to the name Parliament, the Parliament. He, I think he got he says he got sued. And, and so he changed. He kept changing it. But I think Parliament Funkadelic or just P-Funk is so fucking cool. Yes, it is. It, it is. really is like just the word Funkadelic. Like, yes. I, that's why I'm saying I was not expecting this. And so we we did a little bit of research and. Uh, George Clinton is quoted as saying that he never wanted this album is because he never wanted to be pigeonholed as a black artist of mm-hmm, their time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, like I mentioned, you have the new Negroes. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you this. Yes. Have you ever had to do roles that made you uncomfortable as a black person? Absolutely. Absolutely. And because, you know, the thing about these labels of blackness, a lot of these labels are not made by black people. Yeah. It's sort of like. It's the and that's the, what the whole point of the new Negroes is. You tell your own story louder than the stories that are being told about you. Yeah. So it's like all the identities, if you will, that Black people have have been put on Black people by others, and Black people will take them on sometimes or reject them or whatever. But it's like we're people. So it's kind of like what George Clinton is doing here, because he's also credited along with Hendrix, and you know, you obviously you hear the Hendrix influence. Oh my same God! With, yes. Same with Zappa with the whole like in the Fantasia, and. Hendrix is and and George Clinton are both people that are considered to be um, planting early seeds of what became this idea of Afrofuturism. Okay. So people will say, you know, Sun Ra, the jazz. He's like a yeah, jazz. Yeah, I've heard of him. I don't know. Space his music is about. the place, and it's like Sun Ra was the was considered one of the first people to kind of envision black people in the future and black people in space. And so Hendrix is standing on that idea. Uh, took it further. Um, George Clinton took it further as well, where it's like there's these sci-fi references. It's all about you know the spaceship, mothership, and all these different things, and creating this mythology that sort of stands as its own identity and stands as its own idea. And that's kind of what they're doing, I guess you could say. Sure. But of course, all of that can only be a reaction to people trying to put you in a box all the damn time. So it's like, yeah, I mean, that's been my my whole career in stand up has always been like I'm not appropriate somehow, you know. I don't fit a certain box and I, that has to do with how much the industry, I guess you uh, you could say, how much the industry has um become mostly marketing. So it's not necessarily about who's good and who's not. It's about what sells and what doesn't. 100%. And so it's always 
if something is easy to define and it's easy to say what it is, it's easier to sell it. And if it's outside of the box, that's a harder sell. So I've always kind of been outside of the box and harder to sell. And I guess that, you know, I've kind of folded that into my identity, which, which becomes internalized, you know, self-hatred or whatever the hell. But it's kind of like when I became a stand-up and, and an actor, there's been a plenty of times where I'm just like, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, or I, but, you know, you need the money. Do you have anything in particular that just sticks out to you that really just made you just like as soon as maybe looking back at it now that you're just like, man, what the f like your Hollywood shuffle moment, which is like, you know, can you be more black? And you're like, what the fuck, dude? I mean, you know, I, 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 I feel like it happens mostly in auditions more than anywhere else. Yeah. Where it's like I've gone out for characters that are like, you know, thug one and stuff like that, just like Hollywood shuffle, where it's kind of like. Oh, okay. I'm I'm the first thug. <laughs> you know, <laughs> three three thugs came. One brings gold. One brings frankincense. You know, one, I was brings, really, one brings myrrh. I, I was really identifying with thug too. I mean, I know. Can I go in for that one? Okay. No, I'm thug. That's one. a little bit more in my lane. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like there's stuff, especially earlier in my career, where it's like I'm trying. I'm thinking about a, a show I did on uh, MTV. Uh, I want to say it was called The Game Killers is what it was called. Okay. It was like an axe ad that had become its own reality show. <laughs> it was very strange. <laughs> and I kind of, pl I played a character that's supposed to be a comedian. But the whole thing was that like I, it's a lot of people, they're on a fake dating show, but they don't know it. So it's like a guy who's on a date with a girl. He doesn't know the girl's an actor. He doesn't know that all these people that they start interacting with are plants I being one of them. Yeah. So it's sort of like I stepped into a couple of different stereotypes. I, I black stereotypes, comedian stereotypes that I didn't care for. But I was like, oh, I need to, you know, I need, you need to, the money. I need this you, money. Yeah, I still need to make it myself somehow. So it's kind of like and that's a big thing where it's sort of like I don't feel like that. My authenticity, if you will, has always been in question for people. Again, people put things on if you're black you're supposed to be this 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 and this and since i don't easily fit into those categories or i don't feel like it in my essence sometimes i say that like if you're black there's certain places you can be from that are like the ivy league of blackness like it's like you know people say oh i went to harvard I went to stanford i went to you know princeton that's recognizable if you say i'm from brooklyn i'm from chicago i'm from atlanta people know what that means there's a context there. wow yeah i'm that's like you know that's the harvard and the princeton and the stanford of blackness <laughs> yeah you know i'm from harlem or whatever it's the mit of blackness you know fuck and i'm from vegas i'm from a small country town in new mexico and then moved to las vegas nevada so that's like the asu of being black yeah. of being black what is that devry people people don't know <laughs> It's a satellite campus. That's the, that's what gets trippy about labels. Like I have a friend who's an, uh, a writer, right, a novelist, and they want to put her book in African American literature. There is no African American literature. There's just literature. Yeah. Some of it is written by African Americans, and it might speak to that experience, but it doesn't mean that if you aren't black, you can't read it. Yeah, of course. That you can't understand it, because anybody, I think, any artist is looking for the universal inside the specific if that makes any sense that makes perfect sense yeah and that's what people like rock Chappelle, patrice could do is they could take like universal ideas and then have a proof about this universal idea from a very specific experience or have a proof about a specific idea from a very universal experience yeah you know like how old is 14 really like things like <laughs> controversial things you know sure. i mean look and we're talking about deaf comedy jam too so it's like again Anytime there's a genre that appears, it becomes a space for people to go to. Yeah. So it's like Def Comedy Jam yielded brilliant, brilliant, influential stand-up comedians. I mean, we're talking about Bernie Mac. Bernie we're talking Mac, about so one of the most uh, iconic, Chappelle. We're yeah. talking about Wanda Sykes. We're talking about all of these really fantastic comedians. And then also, there are the people who are like, I got to be a certain way to get on that show. Sure. And that is true for music as well. You got to fit into a certain genre. So... If you are breaking it, you know, because that's a big thing about like uh, soul and R&B were uh, movements that were grown out of a certain kind of music. But then they became prisons in a kind of a way for certain artists who wanted to expand out of that. I believe that. I yeah. mean, look at the Beatles. How many times did they change what their style was? Look at Miles. You mentioned jazz earlier. Miles Davis just kept creating. And Miles could do that because, well, I mean, he was Miles Davis. But then also like. In jazz, you're allowed to kind of break your 
genre because jazz can be anything any whatever you want yeah but then funkadelic and it's kind of i think about like fishbone fishbone who's another one of my favorite bands love fishbone but they've had a hard go with it because they're not easy to to classify yeah you can't say that fishbone is one freaking thing there are a lot of things i think that george clinton does a lot of things as well let's dive into this record let's do it so like we said it opens with maggot brain yes peter just play some of maggot brain because this is so beautiful. As you mentioned, George Clinton talks about what what could be the has a very apocalyptic tone. You know, he's he's talking about how Mother Earth is pregnant for the third time, which uh, after some research could mean about World War One, World War Two, and Vietnam. Mm. Um, and then he explains he's going to rise above, or else we're going to drown in this shit. Oh, and shit. then Eddie Hazel's guitar starts. Now, do you know the story about this? Mm-mm. About okay. One of the coolest fucking things. All right, so in 2014 memoir, Brothers, George Clinton's memoir, Brothers B, comma, yo, like, George, ain't that funkin' kind of hard on you? I love that. Um, so he said, this is what he says, uh, where are we, saying, uh, Eddie and I were in the studio tripping like crazy, but also trying to focus our emotion. I told him to play like his mother had died, Ooh. to picture that day what he would feel Ooh. and how he would make sense of his life, how he would take a measure of everything that was inside of him and let it out through his guitar. And Eddie knew immediately that he understood what George Clinton was saying. And then you could hear that in these guitar no I mean, like, dude, there is a point in the song. Let's go to... Um, Play uh, minute four, uh, second 25 till about 46, 46, 446, because you can literally hear the guitar crying. It is not even gently weeping, not even gently at all. Like to take something so tragic, the idea of your mom passing away. And then I forgot to add also, there's another part is that he says, I want you to have her the first half play like your mom died. The second half, like she came back to life. Woo! Hence why it just becomes, like, this fuzz guitar becomes this this range of emotion. I'm listening to this in my car and started tearing up because I started feeling it because it was so intense. I'm, That's I'm the saying, experience I had at Rubber Gloves where I was like, whoa, just it went into my heart and my head at the same time. Yeah, and, and so at around f- minute seven, second four, it comes back. Um, it, it's just... To take something so sad and to get that out of somebody. And, of course, like, they are on drugs. So yes. <laughs> you can feel that. That's uh, the delic part. But through your acting or comedic career, has mm-hmm. there ever been, like, a personal, personally tragic story that you've had to tap into to make everyone else feel that emotion right along with you? Ooh, interesting question. Um, suffice it to say that, like, I get afraid of my own darkness, if you will. I get afraid of my own intensity, of my own power, if you will. So I, I pull the punches sometimes on things that I would like to go further with. And a lot of that has to do with, again, my own, my own shit. But, you know, you, you mentioned someone like Patrice O'Neill, and Patrice could just go there. Yeah. He could, I mean, like, you know, talk about standing in your own truth. I remember a friend of mine saying it really well, like, you know, I didn't agree with anything he said, and I never stopped laughing. Because it's true to him. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you agree with him. He can make a fantastic case and make it funny and make it stick to your bones. You know, like he reached into your heart and put some stuff in there. That's what Patrice could do. I question whether or not I have that ability. I think that's the point of comedy in a lot of ways. When sometimes people be like, what do you talk about in your comedy? And I go, like, I think that's the point is to find out what the hell it is that I want to talk about. Yeah. So it's like, these are the things that I'm trying to move toward. I've talked about some stuff like I met my father for the first time a couple years ago, my, my biological father. And I've talked about it on stage. It makes people really bummed out. That's the thing. Like, there's certain things where I, if I, I start to talk about them, audiences, like, really clam up or, like, you know, their butts get tight or they get like, ugh. and then I never want to do that joke again because I'm like, oh, I made everyone uncomfortable in some sort of way. So it's like 
what I need to do is dig deeper, is go dig further, deeper and yeah. go further into it. Yeah, lean the fuck into that. Is and lean if you into lean into that, then nobody, because nobody shares that experience. I mean, people share that they, there are other people that have like lost their father, or you know, he left at a young age and then he came back, so they will identify with that, and then that'll, that'll touch them more than everybody else. But you'll be able to make it entertaining, but you have to trust in yourself as a as a hysterical individual and just go there. And the trust is the thing that like. You know, it's sort of like I've had that trust and I've lost it and I've had it and I've lost it again. I'm in a place where I've lost it again. And that's probably just really? because I'm not getting up a lot. That always but happens. Working, but you're working. Because right I'm working. Now. But it's like if I don't go up for like two, three months, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Why are you? How, you can't you can't just take it. I could I could never imagine going two or three months. Dude, when I, I did a show, I was on a show in Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, shot in Vancouver, British Columbia. One of the most gorgeous what i've heard cities in the world if not north america you know not just north america i could i've never been more depressed in my life and it had specifically to do with the fact that i did not do stand-up for five months i've never ever gone that long without doing stand-up i had no outlet i was incredibly isolated i was sitting in a freaking dark room where the internet only worked in the bedroom so I would wake up, pick up my laptop, put it on my lap, and then get on the internet, and then suddenly it'd be eight at night. And I'm like, I never got out of bed. And I would do that for multiple days in a row. Fuck. And I was just, I was in a dark place. I didn't realize that until I was telling a friend about it. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, hey, what, is there a name for, like, I don't want to be alive. It's like, you want to kill yourself? Whoa, calm down. Calm I don't want to kill myself. I just don't want to exist anymore. I wish I never existed. Is that something? You know, it's like, <laughs> I think you're depressed. And I was like, Oh my God! Is this dep- I had no just the concept of assuming that this was a depression had never even crossed my mind. Yeah. And then that specific just someone saying I think you're depressed like changed everything for me because I was like oh I gotta I gotta take I gotta take gotta pull myself up on my own bootstraps. It was like literally I put my laptop in the living room, and that changed my life for the rest of the time I was there. Just got to get out of bed because I would get out of bed. Yeah. Simply get out of bed, and then I'm like, well, I'm out of bed. Might as well take a shower. Well, I'm showered. Might as well put some clothes on. <laughs> well, I'm dressed. Might as well go outside. Yeah. And then it was beautiful outside. I was still alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. But it, but if yeah, dude, I, you know, I, we were talking about that if tragedy and and using that, like I, I talk about. I'm starting to really talk about the car accident I was in where I lost Angelo back in yes. 2012. Yes. And I don't care if if they get uncomfortable when I say because I do a bit about how getting the dog has changed my life and I'm not a depressed person anymore. Mm-hmm. And and I love it. And I love to feel them get uncomfortable because that means that I'm hitting something and I'm being real. And I still have yet to go into details and I'm still trying to figure out how to take that story and make it funny, whether it's a one-man show or it's going to be just like a, like a 20-minute story in my set. Yeah. But it, it's, it's very powerful when you, when you can really tap into that, and especially when you can identify that you are depressed. Yeah. Because a lot of the times I was just living and not – like I was isolating from the world, and this is when I have a TV show. I didn't leave my apartment, and I just thought, oh, I'm just resting. And it feels worse even <sighs> because you're like, you're, you're like oh, I, I'm on – like the, that was what it was like in Vancouver – I was employed when the recession happened. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, my mom, every, almost every month was about to get kicked out of her house in Vegas. And I was able to pay my mom's rent and bills for two years. Yeah. And I've never been more depressed than when I was working during the recession. And I'm like, I don't even have a right to feel this way. I don't know how many people I know that would, would love to be in my shoes right I, now. Dude, I couldn't tell you how many famous comedians that I'm friends with that are miserable. Because you know what it is? Because they, you know what? It's funny because they have all the money. They have all the money. They don't have to worry about anything. And then they're still sad. Those are the things that, and I, and I hate to say that, oh, I've been early to certain subjects. But it was like, I was trying to talk about being depressed and mental health as a black person before the culture was talking about it. So I backed off about it, backed off because I didn't see any other examples out there. It wasn't until after Black Lives Matter started that people started talking about self care because that was a big thing about Black Lives Matter is like, hey, Take care of yourself. Respect yourself. Love yourself. That's actually a part of what it means to be alive. And I, as a, as a general idea that was out there in the culture for black people, it wasn't yet. Because when I was talking about being depressed or trying to go to therapy, like just black people, the way that I grew up, we didn't think about that. We didn't talk about that stuff. 
you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't even in my mind that that was something that happened. And I had to um, unpack myself from my own racial baggage about therapy when I started going because someone was like, you should go to therapy. I'm like, that white people shit? <laughs> Isn't that for white people? Yeah. To be like, well, to walk out every, after an hour and go like, well, at least I'm still white. Like, that's what I thought <laughs> therapy was. <laughs> I'm going to sit in the room and talk to somebody. But when I, I do that in front of an audience, you know, yeah. so and obviously it's been very helpful, but it's kind of like I didn't even know I had that baggage yeah. about it, you know. Um, so it's kind of like and I've talked about some I try to talk about some of the stuff on stage. But of course, the trust about letting it go to that dark, deep place and then trusting that I can bring it back. I, I waver on that. I get it. I, I feel it. like if I don't have a strong joke, I shouldn't even say anything. Well, you got to imagine if 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 George Clinton doesn't tell Eddie to to do that, I mean, would he have gotten the same sound out of that guitar for for Mega Man? I don't Absolutely think so. Not. I don't think so. Because one, not. you had the drugs, dude. His guitar solo was so strong that he turned down in the recording the drums and the bass and the organs. He turned everything down, so it's literally Eddie's guitar. It, and it, it's a it's a ripping it's, solo. It's ripping. It is. It's a good perfect way to say it, it rips. I, I I put that up there with any guitar solo I've ever heard in my life. And then that brings us into Can you get to that? Yes. Uh, I love this. Play the intro, Peter. Because because if you think about it, this is acoustic funk. I love this song so much. It sounds like this gathering of voices mm -hmm. and it adds up to so much of what they're saying. You know, I once had a life or rather life, life had, had me. me. I love that line. I was one among many or at least I seem to be. Well, I read on an old quotation in a book just yesterday said, gonna reap just what you sow. The debts you make, you have to pay. Can you get to that? And then... I think the best part uh, of the whole so there's two part favorite parts is is the deep bike the deep deep voice guy I wanna know I wanna know I wanna know that's that's like I I just play that Peter just play I wanna know <laughs> just it's so good also the the second vo uh, verse to me it's just the lyrics just are hitting you can hear like this almost mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to call it like hip hoppy feel but when she's like you know i recollect with the mix emotions all the good times we used to have yeah but we were making preparations for the coming separate separate i can't fuck it up jesus christ <laughs> change that peter just play the fucking track <laughs> so this is a, a a reworking of an old parliament song I don't know yes. if you know that. Did you know that? I did not know that. It's called What You've Been Growing. Mm. Uh, what what you be what you've been growing. And this seems to be a song about a breakup, okay? Mm. Uh, can you get to that basically means can you dig it? And I think these are probably some of the best lyrics on the album. Um, people are saying it could be a protest song. When you go through what is written in there, it, it to me just sounds like a breakup. So let's talk about checking out on someone before they've checked out on you because that's one of my favorite mm. places uh, in this where it says uh, you base your life on credit and your loving days are done checks you sign with love and kisses later come back signed insufficient unsufficient funds insufficient funds yeah. can you uh, is there a time where mentally you said to yourself I'm no longer in this well before the person or the situation was aware oh absolutely there's plenty of times there's plenty of times what's one that sticks out well, um, I'm gonna. This person will remain unnamed. Please, no, you don't have to ever. But say I name met names. a woman recently uh, on set over at over at Grace and Frankie, or as I like to call it, Granky. <laughs> Granky is a makeup artist that's from the town that an ex of mine is from, and I asked if she knew her, and she's like, I went to high school with her, and so suddenly I'm talking about this person. You know, this woman hadn't seen her since high school. I dated her as an adult, so she can't even imagine her. She's like, oh, she's 16 in my head. I'm like, yeah, well, we were in our 30s when we dated. So it's kind of like, definitely that's happened to me because, you know, you ever heard of attachment theory? No, I haven't. What is it? 
there's a book it's called attached i highly recommend that if you're if you ever want to try to be in any kind of relationship with any person so i guess it's a bunch of psychologists and sociologists that developed this as a theory of thinking about babies and how parenting affects the personality types of babies okay but of course that stuff holds up until you are an adult and they saw that it still applied to adults because in some ways, when you're in a relationship with someone, you're asking them to reparent you in some kind of way. Your parents are the ones who are the architects of what you understand intimacy to be. A hundred percent. So if you... Yeah, I believe this. There are, there are a couple of main uh, archetypes of attachment, right? Uh, attachment styles, if they call them. Um, avoidant. Anxious. The combination of anxious avoidant. Secure. And disorganized. Now, disorganized, you don't have to worry about unless you're a paranoid schizophrenic, right? Mm -hmm. Or you are trying to love a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, secure, who the hell is secure? I don't even know. It's kind of amazing. Nobody's secure. So avoidant and attached are the result of, I mean, I'm sorry, avoidant and uh, anxious. If you had a kind of a parent that was hot and cold, that sometimes was really warm and then other times was not, and then you never knew when that was going to happen, and you, you just couldn't get a sense of how they felt about you because you always are getting mixed messages. Yeah. It creates this uncertainty about things. It creates this feeling like the, the, the rug is going to be pulled from under your feet, that the other shoe is going to drop, that the ceiling, the sky is going to fall. And that creates an anxious attachment where you start to not trust what you thought was true. Sometimes you might get another piece of information. And you go, oh, my God, everything I thought was true is now untrue and I have to know what's what. That's an anxious style of attachment. So when you get triggered, if you will, your attachment style makes you want more clarity. It makes you want reassurance. Yeah. An avoidant is the opposite side of that. An avoidant is a person who was probably raised by people who never really said how they felt, kind of kept you at arm's distance, stuff like that. So you know how to be intimate through an arm's distance. And avoidants are always single. Because what avoidance do, and I am an avoidant. I, I think I'm say, an avoidance too. I already can tell. What avoidance do is we want intimacy. We recognize intimacy. We want to be with someone. But at the same time, we think that something is intrinsically broken about us. And that anyone who would want to be with us is wrong. And so at some point we start to go, you know, I can't be what you want me to be. As if there's some sort of idea of a person that you should be for this person to love, which underneath that is, I'm not right. There's something about me that's wrong. Yeah. How can you love someone who's wrong? Yeah. That's what the avoidant attachment style oh, is, Oh, that's right? me, dude. You're, you, just, you just summed up me. And anxious and, and anxious and avoidant people always end up together over and over and over again, over and over again, because avoidant people are always single. Yeah. So like an anxious person is like, an anxious person gets with a secure person, they're set. And avoid it might still have problems. I kind of have a combination because my mom gave me the anxious stuff. And my grandma I was raised by my mom and my grandma gave me kind of the avoidant stuff. So sometimes I want to know. I want clarity. I want reassurance. And then sometimes I'm like, you know what? I can't be who you want me to be. I'm just going to go and take a walk and, you know, get out of here. So, you know, all that is to bring up that this relationship I was in, it was a perfect combination of that. She was very anxious. I was very avoidant. So anytime she wants reassurance, I'm putting my guard up. Yeah. I'm shutting down. Yeah. And psychologically, there was, I want, I want to be gone. I don't want to be there. So we even broke, we broke up over text. Oh God. It was like, you know, it was like, a, it was like a, in a conversation where it's like, she wanted me to come over. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to come over. And she's like, do you even want to do this city more? I'm like, no, I don't. And that was like the literally the way we broke up the worst possible way Fuck. to break up. Yeah, that's, but we were, we were kind of, we weren't a good couple. When I look back at it now, I also see that like, there's a lot of, again, because you're trying to rewrite whatever story happened to you when you were a kid. So it's kind of like I'm projecting my mom on her. She's projecting her dad on me. So it's kind of like there was it was doomed from the start, which is probably why we were even attracted to each other. Yeah. What's hotter than doing it on the Viking ship that's going to sink? <laughs> oh, shit. This, this Titanic is going down. Yeah. We better get a swerve on. <laughs> Hit that. it, man. Get, get to that. 
I want to know. Well, you better be playing that, Peter. Uh, that goes into another song, which uh, I think you were talking about time to signature. Hit it and quit it. Yes. Okay. Uh, play Probably the, one of my favorite songs on this album. I mean, how could you not love it? Play the intro, Peter. It's just insane how fucking catchy this song it's is, how catchy. powerful this is. It's just so fucking good, and man. Here's the other thing, and this this song, and it goes back to "Can You Get to That" too, because what one of the things I love about this album is the use of voices, and how he uses voices not just as singing, but like that woman doing that high pitch, doo, 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 you know. It's so, it's like hypnotic and piercing. Yes. And it's like, well, how did he know that that was gonna sound good? You know, even in Can You Get To That, there's all these different levels of voices, and some people's are high, and someone's got that really low bass. I want to like, know. It's like just a, he, he created a symphony, an orchestra, with all the different styles of voices yes. inside of the songs as well. I can't agree with you more. Um, this song is, is so magical. Peter, play it when the verse drops in. It's just the way this guy is singing right here. Can you shake it to the east? Can you shake it to the west? It is just... So it's fucking good. You can shake it for dinner. My fucking God. And then the organ solo comes in. And then when you get back into the verse again, it just it's it just keeps growing. He's adding yeah. these layers and the organ gets stronger. The voices get stronger. You, like there is no way you could not dance to this song. Like Absolutely. I was as I wrote when I heard it for the first time, I just couldn't not dance. I was getting amped in my fucking seat. So this is a song, hit it and quit it. That's a famous saying, right? Yeah. So have you ever been uh, have you, has there ever been a sexual experience where you wanted more of that and afterwards she was like, "Nah, I'm good." Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh which one? You know, I was thinking about this recently. Back in New York, I I met this girl who she was uh, like a like a server at this place where there was comedy shows, and I met her there. She was from Vegas as well, and like we had a really interesting connection, and uh, you know, went out on a couple dates, and uh, it was at the beginning of text messaging. Oh, I remember those days. And so, like, I went to school in Boston after growing up in Vegas. So instant messenger was like a huge thing for me because it was a free way to keep in touch with people that were across the country. Yeah. So like writing text, if you will, to communicate was not abnormal to me. And uh, I was texting her a lot, which was, by the way, one of the things she said when she broke up with me is like, you text me too much. <laughs> uh, the first time a woman has ever said that to yeah. a dude, like you text me too much. I'm breaking Which is up so with weird you. for an avoider. Uh, uh, and avoid it. She and she, we, you know, we we had a date, and then we finally, like, you know, did the deed. And I, um, this is what I pulled out of bio as she was leaving the next morning. <laughs> I'm laughing because what I did was so stupid. Uh, I put on the song "When Will I See You Again" by Babyface as her exit music. Play that, Peter. <laughs> We're asking a lot. Just play, play, play that fucking song. And then never saw her uh, again. That's not true. She broke up with me at a place. At least she did it face to face. She like, we went to lunch. She's like, you know what? I don't want to see you anymore. And I'm like, uh, what? what happened? And I definitely wanted more. I wanted to continue to see her. Um, that was just one instance. There's a lot of them, yeah. But let's yeah. let's take it away from sex. Okay. <clears throat> Are there some things in your life where you're like, man, I wanted to get out of here. Like, there's like you just you want to get in and out as fast as possible. Anything that makes you that uncomfortable that you just like, I just can't. Honestly, concerts. Really? <laughs> I love music. I hate concerts. You get tired quick. It's because there's, uh, you know who they let in the concerts? Who? Literally anyone that can buy a ticket. Like anyone well, that I mean, can buy a ticket. Works, dude. They let in there. They need their money. There's and... too many damn people in there. Yeah. And they're stepping on me and they're spilling their beer on me and they're elbowing me and like trying to like incorporate me into whatever the hell. I, like it's just too many people in an enclosed space 
and I have never liked it. I don't, I don't have that whole like, oh, the music rushes over me and I'm there. I can do that with really good sound equipment at home if yeah. I want it. And so, and also the thing that I hate more than anything else about concerts are people who work at concert venues. They're all kind of dicks. They're a little all, bit. But that's part of what happens because, you know, fans of music are so voracious that they will try to be, you know, amateur car otters to try to get backstage. Oh, yeah, I've done it. And so it's kind of like all these concert venue employees <laughs> are, they're, they're security. They're like bodyguards for whoever's backstage, and they treat everyone with the equal amount of suspicion and disgust. <laughs> and I hate being treated that way when I go to a place to see a, a show. Was there a concert that, that you could say in particular that really set this in motion? Like you were like, all right, this is it. This is the last one that I'm going to go to. Ooh, um, whew. that's a hard one. I mean, like, I, yeah, I went to Coachella like a long time ago. Why? Um, I could never. The idea someone that. took me as a, as, a, as a present. And I wasn't performing. I just went to it. And I didn't even know that it existed. And it was just so damn overwhelming. Did you have an outfit? Did you have your Coachella no, outfit? No, because I didn't know. I was hot. I was wearing too many damn layers. I was walking around in a linen suit and a parasol, and I was like, what the hell's going on here? You would wear that. And a freaking Cuban cigar, just kind of like, well, well, it's the funk, kids. Um, now, I'm trying to think of other places, clubs. I've never been a club guy. Clubs suck, dude. And yeah. I was semester in England when I was uh, in junior year of college, yeah. and we tried to go to this club, and I, I went in there, and I just remember it was dark, smoky, and loud as hell. I was like, I'm... Gone. I am leaving. <laughs> I'm not a big party guy, too. <clears throat> like, the way I go to a party, I show up to a party, right? I go as far to the back of the party as possible. I turn around, and then I start saying goodbye to people. That's I, just, I go, I turn brilliant. around, and I go, good night, good night, good night, and I get the hell out of there. It's brilliant. I got social anxiety, you could say. I do. So do I, but I, like, we both just went to a friend's thing yesterday in different times. Yes. And, like, I, I went in there. I didn't know anybody, and I just found, I saw two guys talking, and I was like, they look cool. I'm going to talk to them. I talked to them for an hour, ate some dip, and I was fucking out. So I got it. Same. I, I hit it, and I quit, quit it. Do, 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 do. This goes right into you and your folks, me yeah. and my folks. Uh, this yes. sounds like a Sly and the Family Stone song. Yeah, and there's some elements in uh, Can You Get to That that sound a little Sly, too. Sure. I mean, you could argue, some people argue that, like, James Brown, Sly, Sly, Sly and the Family, and, of course, uh, George Clinton are kind of like, they took funk to this other level before, you know, because they were kind of creating it. Oh, I wanted to tell you this too. Please. Do you know what the origins of the word funk is? No, please. Um, apparently, it comes from a Swahili word that is about a specific kind of sweat. They have a word for the kind of sweat you get from hard work or from focus, and then they have a word for the sweat that you get from dance and sex. And that's funk? That's the positive sweat. That's the good sweat. And that's where the word funk is a derivative of that word. Oh, wow. Fuck yeah, dude. You so, mean funk yeah. Yeah, fu <laughs> funk yeah. I love funk sweat. Uh, this is it's something that you would you would think is just like just a repeated chant. If you and your folks love me and my folks like me and my folks love you and your folks. I love that shit. But then, it, it, then when it breaks into this the bridge, or which you could call the chorus, or the verse, I don't even know because it's, there's, it really is like that. Everything sounds like he plays like with can, that structure. He like plays that, with yeah. that structure. It becomes this soulful, very positive message. But in our fears, we don't learn to if we don't learn to trust each other, and if in our tears we don't learn to share with your brother, you know that hate is going to keep on multiplying, and you know the man is going to keep right on dying. What I really stuck out is this also is a song, it's a social commentary on class system. The rich got a big piece of this and that. The poor got a big piece of roaches and rats. Can you get to that? That's at the end section. Peter, just play some of this fucking song. It's just so goddamn good. What is your relationship with money? And have you ever had a period where you weren't sure how you were going to make it to the next day? Absolutely, man. I mean, I grew up poor. So I have a lot of, I guess you could say, internalized ideas about me and money that have that I'm still working on. So, you know, I mentioned that show that I worked on in Vancouver. And um, that ended. And it took a while. And so I came back to Los Angeles. I had moved to Los Angeles when I got this show. 
And I came back to L.A. and I didn't work for two and a half years at pretty much at all. And I ran out of money and I just blamed myself because I've always been bad with money. And I was like, oh, crap. Now, I came to find out that um, the gentleman that I had hired as my business manager had stolen a large amount of this money. Fuck. So I pressed charges, blah, 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 warrant out for his arrest. In, and also found out he had a warrant in Texas, too, which I should have known that shit before I even hired him. But I was so afraid that I was like, I was so happy to have someone that could handle my money since I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, so I'll just trust this dude. But I was the perfect mark as yeah. far as, you know, as, as he was concerned. So, like, I mean, this was my first year in Los Angeles even. So it's like I had a show that got canceled. I was going out for these auditions, but everything sucked. Everything was kind of like not who I am and I couldn't figure out how to turn myself into what I needed to be to continue to work but at the same time I was resistant to that idea so it was sort of like I hate auditioning I've never liked auditioning I don't even think I'm a good auditioner yeah. so it's kind of like I was in this place where I was trying to figure out what I could do I'm like I can't afford to be in LA anymore I can't go back to New York because that's just embarrassing. So I need to I need to move to a completely different city and be the funniest dude in produce when I become a manager at whatever grocery store I find. Publix, here I come. You know what I mean? Watch out, Kroger. <laughs> it's me, Freddy Kroger. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that was like two and a half. And I, I, the one day, the first time that I was like, you know what? Because I got really depressed, and I was like, you know what? I need to just figure out what I'm going to do. And I remember leaving my apartment and I walked down to this coffee bean. I got myself a coffee, you know, new lease on life. I come back home and on the taped to my front door. My front door, I was like in an apartment building. So you have to go through multiple gates to get to my door. Yeah. Which means that a manager let whoever this person was in. Taped to my front door was a summons from Boston University, my alma mater, who had uh, sued me for a loan that had defaulted. And not only had they sued me, but there was already a court uh, date that had happened that I didn't show up to. Wow. So my failure to show meant that they were awarded twice the amount of what I owed. It was $4,000 they sued me for. I didn't show up, so they were awarded an $8,000 reward. And when I called, they were like, we'll take sixty five. dollars And I'm like, I don't have six. <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have six or five. Or five. <laughs> So it's kind of like I literally fell to the ground and I was like, that's it. I'm done. I was like, I, I can't. I was in too much debt and people were coming for me. I was being I be, I'm being sued now. My credit score was three. So it's kind of like I got to figure out how to get out of Los Angeles, go somewhere, get a job. And it kind of was like another year of me just taking whatever odd job anyone was giving me. I was working the road a little bit. Yeah. But like didn't have enough credits to like really work the road. Some clubs would book me as a headliner. You know, people stop booking people as a feature. Like unless you're opening for someone very famous, like it's impossible to get feature work at a club. Like yeah. it's always going to be someone local, which is fine. But as somebody who wasn't at the credits of a headliner, but couldn't afford to only be a feature, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. So that lasted for a while until. I don't even remember how it happened. I just decided to take advantage of some connections that I had, and I ended up getting a job writing at writing sketches at Funny or Die. And then I had that thing, and it was going to last for three months. It was like a preliminary period, and then it was going to end, and then in September that it ended, I had road gigs every weekend. And then, yeah, and that was like the first time in like almost three years, and I'm like, I know what I'm doing for the next four months. Because it was touch and just that and security go. must have just felt so fucking great. It to... did, and in the middle of that, I auditioned for Grace and Frankie. Wow! It was like right at the me being like, I got to change everything, and I had this work, and I felt okay. So when I went to audition for it, this for Grace and Frankie, this desperation that was essentially embedded in every move I made was gone. So I was able to relax, yeah, and actually be good <laughs> this instead audition. of like just I fucking need this, please God. Basically, but then, but then also you have the show that's coming out now, and I mean you're still on Grace and Frankie, um, like so you're so do you like because of what you had been through? Do you just hold on to money now, or are you do you? You know, well, you know, and it's you know my priorities are different now because I'm married and have a child and another one on the way, so it's kind of like. 
yes, I'm holding on to money in a different way. Um, the whole experience of being robbed was my wake up call, if you sure. will, my quote unquote bottom for my financial feelings, where it's like I just have to fo I have to face these debts. I have to face these collectors. I have to face this shame that I have because I was raised in a house where it was like the only people that ever called were bill collectors. It was oh, either yeah. bill collectors or my friends from high school. And mom was like, don't answer that phone. Don't answer that phone. It's a bill collector. So it was kind of like that. the only way I ever knew to deal with anything financial was to avoid it. Yes. I can't agree with you more. And I was uh, – we never really had money. Well, we did at first when I was young. And then around when I was like – God, I want to say like twelve. Like mm -hmm. my my dad took a different job, and I, I we we almost lost the house, and it was like coming home and like seeing my mom crying every day, and mm. just and just I remember like they were fighting nonstop, and I used music as a way to escape. I would just put my headphones on my like Walkman and mm. just get out of the house. And uh, it really, I always had a problem with money, where it was like because I had been broke. Over and over again out here in Los Angeles. And I just Which is part of being in Los Angeles. I know, but it's like I treated money like, and I always have. I've been like, it's like, oh, I'll get more and I'll just go out and <laughs> spend whatever I want. And that's yeah. kind of the way I used to live. And then recently, maybe the last two years, when I really got money, I realized that I didn't want anything other than time. I just want my time to work on the things that I want to work on. So, so like, yeah, I went out and bought new speakers, but that was the first thing I had bought for myself. Really, that was like kind of extravagant in yeah. forever. And and so now it's like I I, I keep my money. Uh, I want to just be able to never have to take a job that, that don't I don't want. want to take. Yeah, I mean, I, I and th that's that's interesting too because it's kind of like I was spending so much time hustling to get a job that that being able to kind of step back and relax and think about what you want to do um, is always valuable. Of course, if you are broke, it's harder to do. Yeah. Cause then you're, then you spend, then you're in the rat race. You're yeah. living check to check. That's how I grew up. Yeah. So it's like, I was, that was familiar to me. Everybody's living check to check. Right. Yeah. And so, but then trying to figure out like, okay, well if I have this amount of money, then I need to give myself the time to relax to re regroup and think about what else I want to do to continue sure. to make money in the way I want to make it. And that's very difficult because a job is a job is a job is a job as we're taught our entire life. But that's not true, especially in entertainment. Every no. job is not equal. No, not at all. Because it's still you. These lines are so blurred. You know, what personal and professional reality and content, all that stuff is insanely blurred. So it's really hard to kind of stick to your guns through all of that stuff completely um the, the song also though has this you know it's me and my folks you and your folks yeah. like what is your relationship with your parents like um it's all over the place it's all over the map um i mean you know we, you were talking about like uh when you were a kid and being broke and like you know coming home to your parents you know there's fighting and there's crying and stuff like that so it's like I was born in a small town in New Mexico. My mom was 19. My dad was probably 21. Um, I only met him a couple years ago, my biological father. So he was not in my life at all. And what I have gathered from meeting him and, and talking to my mom about this stuff, which, by the way, a couple years ago was the first time my mom ever opened up to me about what happened, the circumstances around my birth. We just never talked about it. That was kind of the rule, if you will, the culture. is a culture of silence in my house. Yeah. And so, and my mom was an addict, you know, growing up as well. So it's kind of like, which is probably a result of all of this rejection from, you know, this is a traumatic thing to happen to her at 19. For my father to be like, not mine, and then never and see then her out. ever wow. again. And then my great-grandparents, who are the ones that raised me, her grandparents, disowned her because they were old-school Southern Baptist church people who were like, you had sex outside of wedlock. God is mad at you. So we don't even want to be a part of this. And then they raised me until I was like six, something like that. My mom got out of college, got me. We moved to Vegas and to be with my grandmother as well. So it was me, my mom, and my grandma growing up, basically. Mm -hmm. Then about middle school-ish, my stepfather came into the picture. We never got along, me and this guy. Um, he is a, he's a hard case. 
um, and he's still around. My mom and him have two uh, daughters, my little sisters, that are 13 and 14 years younger than me. Um, the oldest of the two has her own daughter now, my niece. And so my mother and I went through a lot of healing, I guess you could say, my sophomore year of college. And uh, I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Like, it was growing up in Vegas, and it was probably about sixth, seventh grade that the addiction started to kind of really take a toll. And that, because I was getting older, and I was going through, you know, puberty, and I was 13, and kind of asserting my own independence, and looking more like this man that, you know, broke that, her yeah. heart. Oh, I could imagine. It's a lot of, and, and that's what I'm talking about, this intimacy stuff, int intimacy stuff is a lot of... Someone, my mom, my mom loved me and was mad at me at the same time. So I thought those were the same thing. That's why I got into a lot of bad relationships when I got older. Of course. Because I'm like, oh, she's mad at me. She must care. You know, oh, she cares about me. She must be mad. It was kind of like those were the same thought to me. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also assuming this other thing. So it's kind of like always feeling like I'm guilty about something. Um, so basically... Me and my mom, it took us a long time to kind of come back from all that stuff. You know, it was her getting sober and then me being in college. Because, you know, I, I forgot this until the other day. <laughs> it's weird to what? say that I forgot this. I was homeless in high school. Ah. And, I, and I forgot it because I had places to stay. Like, I wasn't on the streets. But, like, I had a friend who let me stay in his uh, like an extra room that his family had mm -hmm. and then my girlfriend my senior and junior year of, of uh, high school I lived with her and her mom through my entire senior year and then went from there to Boston and when I came back to Vegas I did not stay with my parents I stayed with my grandma because she went out moved out and got her own place I slept on her couch while working a couple of different jobs and then I just stayed in Boston as much as I could without doing all that stuff so I was like oh that technically is, is homeless like I didn't ha have a place to go my parents kicked me out like I crawled out of my bedroom after a physical fight because it was it was abuse and there was yelling and punching and kicking and screaming, and like I crawled out of the window of this apartment complex to like call a, f a friend of mine to tell her what had happened, and then when I came back to my room to crawl back in the window, I saw the light go off, which means that they were there. I tried the window; they had locked the window, so I had to go around to the front, and then there was a trash bag of my clothes there, so I just took that slept at a friend's floor that was upstairs in the upstairs apartment and then took that whole trash bag <laughs> slash my life to yeah. school the next morning I've had, I've had trash bag moves oh dude uh, Good old you're not living bags. unless you have a trash bag not, move you haven't lived <laughs> until that's, dude i'm gonna tell you right now that's why like if you look around my apartment like there's i try to keep it as minimal as possible like i don't have much stuff because i was so used to having to move to move dude like, at the drop of a hat this is a big thing for me as well. Like I realized like a lot of my young life, I never put up anything on the walls. I used boxes as my tables, but then never unpacked them. I was just always ready to leave somewhere. Yeah. This idea of settling in, you know, planting roots, making this my own space is still only a couple of years new. But a lot of that is just, uh, as my therapist would say, family of origin stuff. This kind of constant feeling like I don't belong. I could be. I could go somewhere. You know, they would kick me out. Um, I'm moving from place to place to place. We also. I grew up in apartments. Yeah. So it's kind of like an apartment is by definition a temporary situation. At some point, you grow out of it. You need more space, or you know, you just never own the place. So there's only so much you can do to it. You can't change it. You can't paint it. You can't you know, like do all these things. Anything you do, you put a painting on the wall, you're going to have to pay for that when you leave. You yeah. know, Oh, it came out at your deposit and all that stuff. So it's kind of like, sorry, the question was no, no, what, no. what I, my relationship is, is with I, my folks. I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, I, but that's, but you, and you got that from your family. Is that what you're seeing from your mom in particular? Yeah, it was very strained. I mean, it was, you know, and uh, my mom was, she was abandoned by her family. So it's kind of like that idea that there's someone that you can depend on you know that is related to you was never part of her 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 worldview and so i got that same thing from her if you will yeah and so it was kind of like it didn't it wasn't until i was in college that we started to kind of heal and talk and think about uh because i had an experience where i kind of realized um what addiction was if you will as opposed to it being, uh, because, you know, the culture talks about addiction like an addict is just something's wrong with them. You know, it's not, it's like, oh, you're, 
genetically you're bad, you know, you're predisposed to be bad or yeah. somebody did, you know, but it's like, it's a reaction to some situation. I heard a doctor say it once that it's a, a addiction is a, um, a temporary solution to a problem, you know, cause he's like the, the whole medical industry is like, why are you an addict? Why are you an addict? Wrong question. The question is, why are you in pain? Yes. Addiction yes. is a response to a deep pain. You can address the addiction, he said, but if you never address the cause, the root, the pain that this person is trying to numb, then the addiction will come back in different forms. It might not be this particular substance, you know. But yeah. But it might be something else. But as long as it doesn't get in the way of you going to work, no one cares. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> So that, that's funny you're talking about about addiction because that kind of brings us into the second, the next track, which is super stupid. And uh, this is this once again, this is a rock and roll song. When that shit kicks in, I was driving and I went from fucking ninety. <laughs> I just was like, I was just going ninety, hundred miles an hour down the one hundred and one, and I was just like, <laughs> dangerous. Fuck yeah! Listening to the lyrics. Uh, Basically, this is a song about buying heroin instead of coke and dying. So, uh, and then given the chemical nature of George Clinton and the guys, I can tell if this was an anti-drug song or a just pro like take the don't take the wrong drug by mistake song. Mm. Uh, you can hear the Hendrix elements. Yes, definitely. A hundred percent of it. Peter, play the guitar solo at minute one, second thirty-four until that shit kicks in. <laughs> What is a super stupid decision you've made in your life that is stuck with you and you're still feeling the consequences? A super stupid. I mean, wow, that's that's interesting. It's hard to pinpoint one thing. I actually have this deep need, if you will, to feel wrong. So I, I pour over all kinds of decisions I've made that are long gone. Yeah. I pour over things that I said or things that I did. I'm like, oh, that wasn't the best. I like, I, I dig them up to make myself feel bad out of nowhere. Yeah, I do that. Like if I'm just feeling really good one day, I'm like, ah, oh, but what about that time in eighth grade? <laughs> like I just, oh. I just have to go there to get it. I'm like, ah, oh, that time in eighth grade where I said that dumb shit. Oh, what an asshole. I'm like, this is forever ago, but I can't let it go. Yeah. Because I want almost, I want, almost want to, want to drag myself down with these, keep myself in place, if you will, yeah, in quote unquote place, make myself you know real or whatever. So it's kind of like I think about a lot of uh, things that I did. Here's a here's an interesting um, thing that I pour over again. This Please. is a, this is a thing that's like a miscommunication thing. I wonder. I, I think about this a lot. This was in college. I was probably I was a sophomore. This girl was a freshman. We lived on the same floor in this dorm, and so there was a a chemistry there there was a thing there we hung out a lot and then one day i literally i just literally asked her if i could kiss her and she was like yes and we suddenly we're making out suddenly when she comes over it's not we're no longer hanging out we're making out right and then i decided oh maybe i'll try to take it to the next level so we're on the bed we're kissing you know clothes are coming off i'm more undressed than she is right so i am fully naked she is not yet but I have established the idea of full nakedness. <laughs> full nakedness, as we say in the South. But so, as naked. But she's, but, she's fully but clothed? Naked. She's not fully clothed. Okay, no. at least. Thank but God. But she's wearing more clothes than I am. Yeah. And we're making out. And then she goes, you know what? I, I maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And I go, oh, okay. I put my underwear back on. And what I said was, and this is what I pour over this is a it. lot. What is it? I said, I should have known. There's a bunch of different ways to take that statement, right? Now, what I meant was I should have been more aware. Yes, yes, okay. I should have been more aware of, of the fact that you were maybe feeling uncomfortable and maybe not taking it to the point of me being buck naked. Or or it could be, <laughs> I should have known. And that's what I pour over is maybe she thought that's what I meant. 
as I did that, like, should have known blue balls yeah, kind of shit. You're that kind of girl. Because it got weird after that. It got very weird after that. Now, it could get weird after that just because we went to this this uh, this wall and we didn't cross it, you know? Yeah. And I didn't, I wasn't offended by that. I was just kind of like, oh, I should have known. I should have been, you know, I was thinking I should have been listening more is what I was thinking in my head. Yeah. But I said I should have known. And maybe she took it as I am, you know, putting her down. Like I'm I'm blaming her for me not being able to get my, my rocks off. Yeah. So it got a little weird after that. And like there was a distance thing. And then there was a point where we started not talking. And then I kind of. I don't even know if it was a month after this, maybe. I essentially confessed my feelings to her because I never said, like, I like you a lot. Yeah. It's something as simple as that. So I decided to say that. And I said, I still have feelings for you. And, you know, do you feel the same? And she's like, I don't. And so we just, and that was it. And I was like, she's like, I would like you to leave me alone. And I stopped talking to her. I just left her alone. And I pour over this oh, man. moment. The me saying, I should have known. I, I come back to this moment so often yeah because i'm like man she thinks i i I, that that i insulted her you know like that but i that's not what i meant but that's like you you almost wish that you could have said i should have known i i'll put my clothes back on i'm so sorry that's you should have said i'm sorry dude but it was awkward and i felt uncomfortable yes of course because also you're young and it's like that shit happened this is the thing i've been doing my whole life which is just living in the past and just and just sitting in it and wishing i would have done stuff differently but you didn't Yes. And so you just have to accept it and just go, cool, that's the past. I've learned from that now. But this is the heart of what anxiety and depression are. Exactly. Exactly, dude. All right, let's 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 jump to the next song, Back in Our Minds. Uh, this is, there's that weird noise. Peter, play that. It's like a... Again, because George Clinton produced this whole album, right? Yes, yes, he did. And it's just like, what a mind. Like all the different sounds, all the different elements, how it all kind of it, it mixes together. It's yes. like, how did he know that this was going to work? This well, the it's funny magic. thing, the funny thing about back in our minds, uh, it just it's I, I, I think that instrument was him just hitting like a bowl filled with water, like a just oh, doop, doop, doop. Nice. I have no idea. Uh, but this song, literally, it's like I was just having so much fun listening to this because it just sounded like a bunch of people together, all fucked up. Just, just singing their asses off. Like we don't fight now, ma. We done closed that door. This time for sure, we can't stand no more fussing and a cussing each other. When we're souls to your brother, living in the world we all live in. It just sounds like, like just friends having the best time. Fucked up. What is the most altered you've ever been? The most altered. What do you mean by? Well, I was altered. gonna say. Well, I, 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 that was that's was definitely one of David's questions because usually I would just be like, "What's the most fucked up you've ever been?" <laughs> well, fucked up and altered are very different. Well, um, you take it however you want to take it. This is your this is your shit. So, because fucked up um, to me, it kind of denotes a a sloppiness, if you will. Like it was not your intention. I mean, people people do have that intention. That you know, people are like, "Oh, I'm gonna get fucked up this weekend." So people do have that intention to go buck wild, to go past their limits, right? But altered is a different thing. Altered could be fucked up, but it could also be going to the jungle and drinking mystic teas, and that's the most altered that I have ever been. Tell so so what? So you went to the jungle? Went to the jungle. What jungle? Peru? Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Yeah. Please tell me more. Because oh, I'm, 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 like, I'm done. It's illegal. No, I'm, joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Good. No, we got um, it. We got it on tape. Get him. I, I, you know, I've, I've taken a couple of different psychedelic drugs like mushrooms or ayahuasca. Um, you know, and that's the other thing. Funkadelic. Right. So it's kind of like standing on the shoulders of Hendrix where it's like Hendrix was an R&B dude, a blues dude who went to England and was there when the psychedelic. Movement music start, yeah, 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 started, and then he confused what he did with that and became his own unique thing, and then he set forward George Clinton being able to happen, Bootsy Collins being able to happen, you know, um, uh, Fishbone being able to happen, stuff like that, Living Color, you know, all these different bands that are black people that are doing rock music, yeah, because it was like, no, you guys do R and B, it's like we could do it whatever the hell we want, but it's like again genre stuff. So it's kind of like it is a movement that is based on, I think, 
taking these drugs and kind of breaking your mind open, stepping into, if you will, a plane <laughs> yeah, uh, that is outside of everyday worldly experience and then incorporating that into how you communicate with the world, right? So that's why I think that funkadelic is like, oh, it's psychedelic, but it's funk. So it's the yes. fusion of psychedelica and funk put together. And that's why it has these trippy themes, trippy sounds. It's kind of like, well, let's do that our way and make it its own unique thing, which I think they achieve, right? Oh, 100%. So my, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I went to the, I drank ayahuasca with shaman and saw the most intense. <laughs> I want to do that so bad. Like, it's, so bad. And like, I need to go back, man. And, you know, and I used to... Uh, I used to kind of shame myself, I guess you could say, for being so new age, something like that. But it's kind of like, all this is tribal, indigenous people stuff. They've been doing it for like thousands it's of years. It's been around for thousands of years. Black people were doing this in Africa. There's these stuff. This stuff is in Africa. This stuff is in South America. So it's, it, this stuff was here in North America before we, of course, we killed all those people. Yeah, unfortunately. You know, so it's kind of like, I'm just going back to ancient stuff to see what it, what it has to offer. Because if it's been around for thousands of years and people have been using it as a healing medicine, if you will, then maybe there's something to it. Of course, it's scary, but, you know, you won't necessarily lose your mind, although somebody used to say that. A lot of people, because a lot of people, when I first went to do it, I was, my first time, was with a group of people, it was a lot of their first time. That was a common theme. I don't want to lose my mind. I don't want to lose my mind. And one of the people that was running it was like, you should be so lucky to lose your mind, my God goodness to stop thinking and overanalyzing every single thing that you do to only live only in your intellect and your ego and not have a connection to your body and the ground and the earth around you that sounds fantastic losing your mind and i was like whoa bro <laughs> i didn't say bro but i thought it <laughs> which is almost the same if yeah you're Catholic. You're like, uh, same as saying it um, um no, keep going please so yeah i mean like the whole thing with ayahuasca is that you're supposed to have a, a prayer, if you will, or an intention that you, a question you ask the spirit. And so it's kind of like my first one was, show me who I am. That was the first thing I asked. Because as we've talked about labels, we've talked about this industry, we've talked about our childhood. So it's kind of like I get very confused because it has been a major theme in my life. I'm being told that I am not what I am. The entire time I'm being told that I'm not black. I'm being told that I'm not a man. I'm being told that, you know, all these different things that I've been confused so long as who I am. And I chose a profession where I get to change forms, if you will. I've chosen a profession where I get to shape shift and mythologize myself. I mean, that's what I think stand up is, is that you are the hero of your mythological story. Yes. And so you tell the story of your triumphs and your failures on the journey towards what enlightenment fulfillment what whatever everything that everyone is hoping for i think that's what any stand up is doing when they get on stage is they are mythologizing themselves and the, the the danger is i remember who was it lewis black i think he said a long time ago that like you play a character on stage the character is parts of your personality it's like if you think of your personality as slices of a pie your stand up comedy character is three or four of those slices fully exaggerated right but the thing is we as comedians get so used to having to filter all experiences through that lens that it becomes the only way we can see things we create a character that is us but isn't us and then we turn ourselves slowly into the character that's on stage hmm. and we forget what is actually us and what is the myth that we are reporting and i do that so show me who i am was the first thing i wanted to know and i and i drank the tea and it takes a long time ayahuasca is dmt yeah it's combined with something else that makes it last four hours because i think i've heard i've never smoked dmt or whatever people say oh it's like 15 minutes 20 minutes long this is like a four to eight hour long experience where you're in this plane and it's kind of i mean it's incredible and it's scary it's terrific and terrifying, you know? So it's like I got to see and get information about stuff that I never 
even considered would be useful to me or that I even thought about myself. Did you feel, did you get what you wanted from that experience? Like, did you come out? Do you feel like you've grown because of that? And absolutely. Like, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing, though, because you you it's a retreat. You leave this world, Los Angeles. I go to the jungle where it's quiet and dark at night. And they're like, hey, every time you wake up, make sure to shake out your shoes and clothes. There's tarantulas. And then I'm there in this quiet, silent place, have this insane spiritual experience. And then I get on a plane and come back to Los Angeles. And then that's when the world gets back on you again. So it's easy to feel that the closeness, if you will, and that fullness that you can feel there. And then you come back and then everything, everyone starts, everyone that you talk to has a hammer and they hit you over the head with it. And then at some point you're like, oh, Jesus, I've been hit over the head with a hammer for three years. I can't even remember what it feels like to feel whole or feel peace. Sure. And my problem is that um, is integration, I guess you could say. I learn a lot of this stuff and I go, oh, I see. But how to integrate that into one's life? And to put it forward as a practice or to apply it, that's where the difficulty is. You can get all kinds of answers, but that doesn't mean that it's going to change how you act in an everyday situation unless you work at it. Yes, completely. Now, I want to I want to talk about, keep continuing what we're talking about. That brings us into our next song. Our last song. Because Wars of Armageddon, to me, just reminds me of a bad trip. Mm. It, I mean, I've had a bad trip. Which I got to talk because it's like first before I say just a bad trip. I mean, it's it's just random noises. It had a very like bitches brew element to yes, it. Yes. So it's just it's just bitches avant- brew. And yeah. Yeah. It's just perfect. Avant garde yeah. jazz. I dude. at one point I heard a fucking cow mooing. I was like, all right, this. But this reminds me of um, uh, of this bad trip. When I was uh, 15 years old. I went to, uh, I'd already taken LSD a few times, and my friend Tassos and uh, and Ben and Mark Thomas and the guys I was in a band with were like, we're going to all finally take more acid than just one hit. Let's take three tabs of acid Whoa. on this Friday night. And I was like, cool, man. I was like, I can handle it. And we go into Tassos' backyard, and he sets up a tent, puts a couch in there, gets incense, gets candles, and we all start tripping. And at first, it was fine. Everything was fine. Of course. Everything's Isn't great. Isn't always how it goes? It's always great, dude. The quiet having, before the storm. Just, yeah, dude. And it's just like, I remember talking to a buddy, and I was like, ah, oh, this is so great, and going on a jungle gym. And then the acid starts really, really starting to course through my body. And I go into the tent, and Tassos is sitting on the couch, and he's like philosophizing, like, then the world is round, and that means that our hearts are round, and, blah, and whatever the fuck he's saying. <laughs> yeah, sure. And the next thing I know, I start looking around the tent, and I start seeing swastikas everywhere. Ooh. Just so, so I'm just like looking around, like, does anybody else see the swastikas? Is this a Nazi tent or whatever I say? And everybody's like, nah, man, I think you're just the acid, just a little strong. And then I just like, well, I got to get out of here. And so I get up to walk out. And then everybody, because I'm so like, uh, not, I guess, scared, but just agitated, people are like, well, we got to calm down, Josh. And they all start following me. And then mm-hmm. I just. I'm like, you just get the fuck away from me. Get everybody get away. And then I take off running Mm. two miles from Tassos' house to my parents' house at full speed, Baron. Full speed, two miles. So now my heart is racing, dude. What I saw in in that that run is what I base is this song, dude. It's literally Mm. just like I just the random noises. At one point I thought I was running through the desert. As I looked out of my hand, my flesh was peeling off. I remember I ran through this field and I saw this giant, like, um, what do you call it? Like, not a, like a grasshopper or what's the other one? The fucking uh, praying mantis. Oh. I mean, just, just the, everything, dude. I start peeling off clothes. I get, now this is where it gets a little interesting. I get to my parents' house. <laughs> I get to my parents' house and I start beating on the door. And my mom comes downstairs in her nightgown, opens up the door, and I just like mush her face, start running through the house now. So now I'm, I'm, I'm in front of my family. Uh, I start running through the house. My dad wakes up. My sister wakes up. I go upstairs, and I'm just like, you know, I see my cat, and I'm like, who sent you? And I throw the cat. 
And then, dude, like, this is the part I always remember. This is how powerful the mind is. I'm fucking sitting on the floor, like, doing, like, a curly, like, spin. Mm. And my mom's crying, and, and I'm looking around. And as I look at everybody, they start aging backwards, like, start aging, becoming younger. The apartment starts going, another apartment, the house starts going, like, all the things. The TV used to be there. Then it's the older TV they had before this one. And all, they, they it just, everything's changing. Their clothes are changing. And I literally regress all the way back to my the moment of my birth. And then I reenact my own childbirth in front of my family. I'm just like, ah, ah. And then I remember I always like throw my hands up in the air as I reach to the sky and I go like, it's a baby. <laughs> and, and like, like the, oh my God. And then I finally pass out. And I, I wake up the next morning. And I'm in my bedroom, and my, my room is trash, man. And my mom is like petting my head. She's like, are you she's crying? She's like, are you? She's like, what happened? And I was just like, I think uh, somebody drugged me last night. And she's like, well, come downstairs. We're all having breakfast. And then I would go downstairs, and we never spoke of it again. Whoa. Never. Oh, interesting. Never talked about it. My dad just goes, you're grounded. And that's it. <laughs> and that was it. And dude, you, it's funny that you say that because I used to look at it like it was this horrible experience in mm -hmm. my life that mm -hmm. changed the way that I am, right? And, and I never have been the same since then because I saw shit, how powerful the mind was. I was so young too. I was 15 years old because it was so scary. Just like when yeah. I listened to this song. Yeah. Like those, I had my headphones on. I was like, I'm going to fully like take this song in. I put my headphones on, I close my eyes and I listen and it just... It just like it scared me. It 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 just I felt anxious. Just it was so much. It's what you said to me earlier. What's that? Well, when we were talking about like going into intense or dark subjects and stand up, you have to go into it. Yeah. You yeah, know, you have to go you into have to it. Go into it to come out. I just wish I, it's one of those things. I just wish I had somebody to say that to me. Well, you were fifteen. You were unsupervised, right? Yeah. I mean, the ayahuasca experience is a very. It can be very uh, well. The ones that I've had, I think when it's safest, it's very structured. You've got people there who have done this, who have worked with this, know how to handle all kinds of different problems, right? To guide you, to assist you if you need it. Yeah. But a lot of the times, I mean, that was a big thing. That was a big theme when I first went to do it. Like people like feel nauseous, they feel painful, they they feel scared. And they, the shaman were always like, go to it. You're, fe you're feeling it because you're supposed to. It's demanding attention. It wants you, it's begging for you to come to it. And I remember thinking that or, or just making sure to do that when I was like, oh, I feel like really nauseous. And then I would decide to go like, okay, well, what does this nausea mean? I would go to it. And every single time I would learn an insane piece of information, Hmm. You feel like, oh, my stomach is in knots. Well, maybe it's because there's some block in your freaking stomach. There's something that's being held there that it's finally being like, come to me. It's time for you to meet me or whatever, right? Yeah. And you go to it and you see what the hell it is maybe and then it's gone. Then it's gone. All right, you want to do some facts? Let's, give me All some right, facts. There's a whole lot of facts getting down, getting down. There's a whole lot of facts getting down. Okay. The cover photo of the lady with the afro buried in the dirt screaming was shot yes. by famed photographer Joel Brodsky, who also shot the sole genre-defining Ohio Players uh. and Isaac Hayes album covers as well as oh. iconic debut covers for The Doors, MC5, The Stooges, and Kiss. Damn. So you can see the maggot brain image reflected in many other artists' covers, including Redman's Dare is a dark side. Huh. What does the cover mean to you? Well, I thought... And if you would have brought it... If I would have brought could, it, we could because be it's also it. the back cover. That's that's To me, that's a big story. And I think that the front cover and the back cover are sort of a reflection of the first and the last track as well. The, first, the front cover, it's a woman, big afro, her head is in the dirt. It almost looks like she's just a head. Yeah. And she's laughing or smiling I think screaming screaming it's hard to tell what she's doing but i think she's mother earth and she's giving birth so this front cover is her having the experience of giving birth like ah she's in the middle of giving birth and it's like all of these feelings are happening it's like she's hysterical there's laughter there's tears there's crying and then the album is the experience of the birth sure 
And then in the back of the album, it's the, basically a, the same picture as the front, except now it's just a skull that's in the dirt. God, I wish you would have brought the fucking record. <laughs> but this is a headshot. This is a very powerful image. Yes. Now, on the inside jacket, there is a huge maggot framing the top of the liner notes. Beneath the maggot is an excerpt of process number five on fear from the process church of huh. the final judgment. And there's a whole passage. Uh, but I'm just going to try to see if I can uh, get this down to just the bare minimum because I got more. Fear is at the root of man's destruction of himself. Mm. Uh, for those that don't know, the Process Church of the Final Judgment got famous in the 1960s for defying both Jesus and the devil and tangentially related to both L. Ron Hubbard and Charles Manson. Damn. Tell me about a time when fear got in your way. Oh, man. I mean, fear gets in my way all the damn time. You know, I am a fearful person. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, too, just to kind of like how long I have just been afraid for my entire life. And just I'm afraid. I mean, and, you know, and like being a kid, like I'm a black kid walking the streets of Las Vegas. That's scary. I'm and then at home. I didn't feel safe because there's like all sorts of dumb shit happening there, you know, with our family dynamics. So yeah. it's kind of like at no point that I ever feel safe. So fear is my like my my baseline yeah that's like feeling you, you that's why you you run from stuff because it's just like you're like oh no i'd just rather be alone and afraid basically yeah, yeah. um but like when it comes to like because even like when i've been robbed suddenly the fear is gone it's like a strange i'm just thinking about the first time i was ever held up at gunpoint where it was kind of like i had thought about this happening so long it's so often because i don't know how many kids i knew that had been robbed at gunpoint or had robbed someone at gunpoint yeah and then finally it happened and it was like i was like oh i've been rehearsing for this my entire life but <laughs> it was almost like i just knew what to do yeah and it was like this crazy calm washed over me where it's like i'm afraid i'm afraid i'm afraid i saw I, we were at this pool hall in vegas and it was like it was it was notorious for the company that that went to play pool there all sorts of gang bangers and stuff and i was with this group of high school kids and i was like we shouldn't go to this place in the first place they're like it'll be fine it'll be fine and so we went and then of course it was packed there was nowhere for us to be so then we immediately turned around and left and we left at the exact same moment as these couple these three dudes and I just kind of was like, ah, oh, these dudes are going to rob it's us. It's always three dudes. It's always three. It's always three. Two, not so much. One, not so much. Four is too many. Three <laughs> is enough to get reinforced, you know, and be yeah. like, oh, I'm going to rob them. And two people <laughs> like, yeah, do it, yeah. man. So it's <laughs> like we, they left at the same time as us. I didn't pay them pay attention to them at, at first until I saw them kind of looking at us. And I was like, these dudes are going to rob us. And then, of course, we get, to, we get to our car. Our car is right next to their car. Oh, uh, of course. And then... <laughs> We're and then someone's like, "All right, let's just figure out where we're gonna go." And I'm like, "Are you serious? You want to stand in the middle of a parking lot right now and and talk? We should get in the damn car and leave." Yeah. And then one of the dudes is like, "Excuse me," and everyone turns around and he's got a gun. He's like, "Give me all your money," and it's like, oh, and then my hands went up and I was like, I was annoyed. I was more annoyed than I was scared at this time. Yeah. And I'm like, "All right," because generally, people who rob you, well, it's not. I'm just, I want to make generalizations, but he didn't seem like he was going to kill anybody. He just seemed like he wanted our money. It was it was like he was showing off for his friends. And I was like, all right, well, let me just, if I don't do anything, if I don't move, if I don't try to make a run, if I'm just calm, I'll be fine. It'll be fine. But everyone was in shock. You know, yeah. give me your money. Everyone's like, what? And he's like, you think this is a joke? And then he fired the gun at the parking lot. And, of course, it ricocheted, the bullet ricocheted off into my friend's leg. Oh, fuck. Didn't go through, though. It was a graze, but scary to her, you know, obviously. It was oh, scary yeah. to all of us. We're all like, oh, shit. Literally none of us had any money on us. And this one kid gave him five bucks. And then he left. Him and his friends, like, pu pulled away. And I remember thinking, like, that bullet is more than five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that dude just lost money from robbing us. Oh, that's hilarious. I didn't say that, but I just remember being like, that's a five dollar <laughs> bullet was probably six fifty. <laughs> wholesale he just lost money in this robbery that's so fucking funny oh my god all right 
When considering the power of fun- Funkadelic mm-hmm. had as a hard rocking band, I can't help but feel it's a bit of a racially motivated omission and that they're rarely listed amongst their three other proto-punk Detroit contemporaries. Mm. The MC5, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and Ted Nugent's Amboy Dukes. Mm. Not only are they bridged between Motown, but Funkadelic actually shared management with all three of them. Oh. Uh, what are some strengths to Baron Vaughn, past or present, that get overlooked mainly because of prejudice? Whew. My propensity for silliness. I'm a really? very, I'm a silly. I'm a, I'm very very silly, and I like to be silly. So it's kind of like that's why I have a hard time recon, reconciling sometimes my darkness with my silliness. I think that's also sometimes why audiences get weirded out because I'm so silly and I smile a lot and I do voices and I make puns and I do side of, I do sound effects. But then I will talk about not having a dad, you know, then I will then I will try then I will be like, oh, you know, I'll try to like do some argument about race that and I try to talk about race in a way that I've never heard because, you know, you're talking about people like Chris Rock and and Chappelle before. It's like so much has been said about race that's so good already that it's like, well, if I'm going to talk about it, I don't want to go over territory that people have already covered. They've already done it really well. Yeah. Then I'm just doing an impersonation of someone that did something better than me instead of doing it my own way. So I try to like get philosophical. Or I try to get, um, you know, deep, if you will. But because I'm silly, I think people go like, "Wait a minute, what's going on here? You were really silly. Now you're talking about something aliens. serious, yeah, yeah. Or, it is, or aliens, yeah." Um, so it's kind of like I feel like my my silliness, if you will, my go- my inner goofiness, my absurdism. Which goofiness, by the way, is another thing I like about this album. There's, there's, it's there's, very goofy. There's such there's a humor, there's a dark humor to a lot of this, but there's a lot of goofiness and silliness to even just the wordplay, the way that he writes. I once had a life, or rather, life had me, is a silly statement. Yeah. He does that a lot too. He kind of reverses statements. If you and your folks love me and my, my folks, folks like like me. You and your folks love me and my folks. It's just and it's just kind of he does this kind of he, stuff. Yeah, he's dude. That's the funny thing about George Clinton is that he is this silly individual, dude. If we so the first record we broke down, he was on. I did Outcast Equemini. Oh and yeah, he's on Synthesizer talking about. Wanting to, I think it's about like I think Byron said it. It's it's if you listen closely, you can hear George Clinton calling a prostitute and asking her <laughs> to do things. He's like he's like you know it, it motivated ejaculation. Uh, he's just saying all this weird shit. So there's definitely a silliness. Too. I yeah. mean, red. He's got like 19 colors in his hair. Yes. I mean, I think he's the epitome of a silly, you know, rock star. I think that's kind of why they can't put well, he's, him. He's 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 and it's it's similar with somebody like Bootsy as well. They're, Very. They're yeah. icons, but again, they've turned themselves into these characters that I go, well, how much of that is what they would be like in an everyday situation? It's hard to know, but I also don't care in a sort of a weird way. Yeah. Uh, according to writer Adam Brent H- Hoftang, yeah, in course. the wake of the sudden and tragic passing of Jimi Hendrix at age 27 in September 1970, there was a there was naturally a desire on the part of some to crown the next Hendrix. Mm. Dwayne Allman, Ernie Isley, Robin Trower, and Johnny Winter were among the skilled players deemed worthy, but none produced this the kind of searing emotional fuzz punched performance that Funkadelic's Eddie Hazel accomplished on Maggot Brain. Were you ever pitched as being the next blank? No, not necessarily because, well, okay. When new Negroes was announced that comedy central was doing our show, there were a couple write-ups that were like comedy central found its next key and peel. And I was like, what? Not at all. We're nothing like You're not Key a and sketch Peele. show. Are you a sketch We're show? We're not a sketch show. No. We're also like not like tonally, stylistically, nothing like Key and Peel. Key and Peel are their own thing. So it's kind of like we're our own thing and we're doing a very different thing, you know? Yeah. But it's just there's nothing else to compare us to. So it annoyed the crap out of yeah. <laughs> annoyed the crap out of me where I'm like, Well, I think people who liked Key and Peel, like I loved Key and Peel, will like our show. But don't watch us expecting us to be like a key and peel, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, then, because the thing is that, like, 
no one it's it's hard to get to get in that category as a as a black comic i guess you could say there's always been this weird thing you know and i don't know if you've ever heard this before but it's like every single decade since the 50s there has been one major black comic that literally everyone has to live up to and everyone gets compared to so it was cosby then it was prior prior then it was eddie murphy then it was rock then it was chappelle and chappelle gave up the throne so Chappelle like stepped away from the peak of his fame when everyone was getting p- compared to him. It's just like that scene in Hollywood Shuffle where everyone's going out for that audition and it's Murphy-esque, Murphy-esque. I'm looking for an Eddie Murphy type. Eddie Murphy type. So it's like I have been compared to one person. So it's no, I, no one's ever said I'm the next something. It's like I've been going out for things where it's like Chappelle type, Chappelle type, Chappelle type. Because when I was in New York, uh, Chappelle show was on. So yeah. it was like everybody wanted the next Chappelle, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I mean, after Chappelle, I guess it was Cat Williams and then kind of Kevin Hart and Kevin Hart now. And now it's kind of like, you know, you got, I guess, Gerard and Donald Glover. The thing is that there's more people now that people are kind of, that are kind of huge that people can be like, oh, we want a Gerard type or a Hannibal type or a Donald Glover type. It used to just be one comic that everyone had to be a Chappelle or a Chris Rock type. Yeah. And um, so, no, I've never been, no one's ever said I'm the next something. Uh, I don't think people even know that I'm here, <laughs> that, I, that I'm the first <laughs> me. <laughs> Sly Stone and George Clinton were two great musicians who sometimes made amazing music together, but uh, more often just egged each other on to greater levels of drug consumption. <laughs> Clinton remembers a note, a dope-seeking stone slipped under his door at a hotel in handwriting flawless enough for a wedding invitation. Knock, knock, put a rock in a sock, and sock it to me, Doc. Signed, co-junkie for the funk. Uh, who is your creative partner or someone who v- you vibe instantly with and gets the direction you're trying to go in? Ooh, interesting. I mean, right now it's Open Mike Eagle, who is my co-host You know of, of New Negroes. He has a very different background than I do um, but also there's so many similarities of our personalities and so it's kind of been interesting to work with him and to kind of see the way that he looks at things especially because he's had to navigate the music world yeah uh, as a as a rapper as a hip-hop artist that doesn't easily fit into a category as well so he's had to do that in a very different way and I've learned a lot from him um, yeah I'm trying to think of who else like one of my f- closest friends um, who has always been a fan of mine, which is uh, interesting. It's Phoebe Robinson. She's half of Two Dope Queens. Yes, yeah, I know her. Um, and she has always kind of just just gotten me, I guess you could say. And um, it is super encouraging. We have a, you know, we're friends, obviously, but it's kind of like she encourages me. I encourage her. It's been this sort of back and forth that's lasted for you know a decade. Um, Creative partner. I'm trying to think of like people who were early creative partners too. There was a dude. Um, his name's Elon James White. He is a uh, a podcaster and a, a stand up comic. I think I don't know if he is doesn't doing stand up anymore. Who lives up in the San Francisco Bay Area? Um, that we started a show many 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 years ago back in New York and Brooklyn. That is sort of like the seeds for what New Negroes is because we did a thing that was like it. New Negroes is like another version, another iteration of like black people coming together to do something. It, it happens all the time in all these different ways. This yeah. is my version of it. Elon and I tried to create a scene and tried to create a thing. We, it was called the Brooklyn Comedy Company. And we did a thing called the Black Comedy Project. We had a show called Four Shades, uh, which was him, myself, Michelle Buteau, and uh, Eric Andre or Jordan Carlos. Mm-hmm. Um, and we would do different variations. And so, like, he was an early collaborative partner, I guess, like the first person that I did a lot of stuff with. And we talked a lot about comedy and kind of the things we wanted to do in comedy and the kind of the shows we wanted to create and stuff like that. So that's 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 another person, I guess you could say. You, everybody you mentioned is fucking I know them and I'm just like that's they're fucking great people like I love Michelle to death I think Eric is one of the funniest people in the world and I think it's like if you surround yourself around people that 
Like you never want, I always said it, it's like you never want to be the funniest person in your group. You uh-huh. always want it to be somebody that makes you work harder. That was Angelo for me. Mm-hmm. Angelo Bauer is still to this day, like I started with him and Gerard Carmichael. And it was like by starting with them and knowing that they were so funny, I had to work so hard just to even be in the same like breath. And I never was like, you know what I mean? It's definitely something that I had to continuously uh, work at, but just to see, be around those two guys, like for the first three years of my career, I mean, it was like the, I mean, it just, it just made me work so much harder. So on an early parliament tour basis, Billy Bass Nelson was navigating and thought he had found a shortcut to Ohio. Clinton recalls we ran a roadblock, went about a mile along the road and came into a small town where we saw all these fucking creatures walking around Zombies or mummies, hands up in the air, and dead look on their faces. We were scared out of our fucking minds. When they saw the Klieg lights, they realized it was not an actual town of the undead, but a movie set. They had Uh... stumbled onto the filming of George Romero's classic horror movie, Night of the Living Dead. What? Yeah, man. This is from his book. What's an environment you've entered where you've been absolutely terrified only to have found out that you misread the situation? Oof. That's an interesting one. Um, This is a stand-up comedy gig thing. Hit me. Higher Ground, which is a a venue in Burlington, Vermont. Uh Uh-huh. I've only performed there once. It was one of my favorite shows I've ever done. And I thought it was going to be a shit show. There was a emo band in the big room next door a group of emo bands emo screamo as someone (laughs) said and so the crowd in there was nothing but 14 15 16 year olds and they're just like until my dying day exactly so all of the parents of those teenagers were like well i'm not gonna drive home so i guess i'll just go to this comedy show and i was like what someone says like yeah it's all the parents of all the teenagers next door i'm like that's horrible (laughs) They're going to hate me. This is a horrible situation. And it was one of my best gigs I've ever had. They just got everything. And they just... were just into the sh- Yeah, they yeah. were into every comic. They were an incredible audience. And I was like, well, I totally misread this situation. Fuck yeah, dude. Uh, when Clinton was growing up in Newark, New Jersey in the 50s, one of his formative influences was Mambo. Mambo was like our disco, he remembers. He studied how people dressed up for a night of Mambo and how sufficiently good dancers could cross gang lines. One of his unfulfilled musical ambitions to cut a version of Tito Puente's Coco Seco. What is something very foreign to you that has become so attractive to you that you've incorporated it into your art and daily life? Hmm. That's interesting. You know, maybe I, I I feel like this is like a almost like a hacky thing that that happens to like some dudes when we get to a certain age when we're we're getting near forty, yeah, uh, becoming more and more fascinated with history. I feel like one of the things that the United States does is mythologize. We're constantly trying to prove to ourselves why what we're doing is the best possible way to do it. We're constantly trying to prove to, uh, to prove to ourselves that this country is perfect and that everything is equal and fair and all these things, everything works and everything is in place. We're constantly trying to prove that to ourselves because if it would, if it, if it, what's happening is perfect and if it wasn't, it would be something that's different. But yeah. when you look at history and when you see like the people that made the moves and wrote the laws and had the influence, it's random. And so I kind of look at that in a new way, especially when I'm thinking about the history of black people in this country, because it's not taught to us. You know, it's not we get it a month you know, of the year and a sanitized, friendly version that can go into a middle school textbook. And you kind of miss out on who a lot of these leaders were, who a lot of um, people were that had all these insane ideas that um, are influential or just you only know a version of them that is sanitized, like Martin Luther King Jr. We get a very sanitized version of who he was. He was a very complex dude, obviously, but he also had a lot of counter culture ideas. You know, people look at Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X is like two sides of a coin where it's like Malcolm is militant and Martin is peaceful. But when you look at the ends of their life, they flipped. 
Malcolm started to become a lot more peaceful because he went to Mecca, went on a pilgrimage, and, you know, met white people who are uh, Muslim and was like, oh, this is a lot different than what I was thinking before yeah. and saw that this was a uniquely American problem. But I think he, in some sort of ways, seems to have come to some sort of interpeace in a different way, even though his life was under threat. But he kind of became a little bit more calm, if that, sounds, if that makes any sense. No, it makes perfect sense. And then Martin Luther King Jr. was the opposite. There was the it was the culture of you know um, uh, I guess passiveness you know of nonviolence and then when he went to Chicago and it was all about redlining and then he gave that speech about Vietnam he was becoming more militant in a lot of different ways and that's kind of where he was toward the end of his life and we don't know about the end of his life because we know about the highlights you know all of the successes yeah but it, it says a lot to who Martin is and more to who this country is or what he had to face before he was assassinated when it came to redlining in Chicago, when it came to taking a stance on Vietnam and stuff like that. So it's kind of like seeing a lot of these historical figures as full people instead of someone who knew exactly what they wanted and said exactly what they were always going to say. There's confusion. There's, there's, there's terror. There's questioning. All of these great people that we learn about are people. And it's just interesting to me to see how they all kind of triumph over themselves. And I kind of, I guess I try to think about that for myself in terms of what I, all my fear and all my nervousness to get deep and to yeah. get dark on stage. And uh, so I'm trying to, and also like just admitting I don't know things. No, I get it. It's yeah. like the most powerful thing. Oh yeah, just 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 like once I started realizing I don't know anything, life got a lot better, and I kept no control. <laughs> once I gave up all my control and just trying to fucking stay on top of, of life and being like, no, I can get all this. I can get it, but I just have to like let it go, and then everything will come to you. So maybe b admitting my ignorance is something that was foreign to me. Yeah, that I am incorporating into my life. When Bill Clinton was elected, George Clinton enjoyed the coincidence of having a president with the same last name. When Chelsea Clinton came backstage with, uh, with Secret Service agents, she joked with the funk master about having a food fight. He dissuaded her, not wanting to get shot down by an overeager fed. While posing for a photo with Chelsea, George realized at the last moment that he should probably conceal the crack pipe he was holding. <laughs> so he just made a fist around it. He goes, it was hot as a motherfucker, burning my hand up, but it worked. The picture without a crack pipe in sight it was in People magazine. Wow. If you had to smoke crack, <laughs> who would you do it with? If I had to smoke crack, who would I do it with? Uh, Prior at his prime, uh, Marion Barry. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it could be anybody. It doesn't it just have to be the, the. Well, all right. Well, no, we could take it to actual crack smokers. Um, oh, it could be with anybody if I had to smoke crack. Margaret with Thatcher. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good old Thatchy. Uh, Thatch Adams, I, I, call, I like to call her. Thatch Adams. Thatch Adams. Um, Tim Burton. <laughs> it's such a weird drug to ask somebody to do it's like you know, usually it's like if you smoke pot with somebody who would you do because you smoke pot and then you talk and you philosophize and you guys are both calm you know at like mushrooms or lsd it's like all right there could be somebody that's really spiritual or something like that but crack is just it's just coke but just i think more intense so coke is like it's gonna make you really focused right really focused and like really talkative so it'd be somebody okay it would be uh maria kondo uh <laughs> Who's that? You don't know about the Con Marie method? No. Who's oh, that? Oh man, she's this Japanese woman with a. Oh yeah, a yeah, show. yeah. The uh, the. I the would straightener. smoke crack with her, so that way we can get some stuff done. Fuck yeah! I that. need to tidy some stuff up. That's a perfect answer. All right, and this is a reoccurring question, and that we'll end on. Okay. Okay. Uh, on a scale of blackness, <laughs> how black is this album? Ooh. On a scale of blackness, um, blackity black. It's it's a very it's very black. That's I, I. That's what I think. Yeah. People don't think of rock as a genre that black people do, for some strange reason. If black people do rock, then it's R and B. You know, 
Um, but I think this is a very, 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 very black album, uh, especially because of the, the kind of the themes that are explored and the way that they are explored, especially like thinking about, you know, the context of who George Clinton was and where he came from and how he did what he did to get to the point of making this album. So that is very, 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 very black to me. Very, very, very black. Especially because, again, these are the seeds of Afrofuturism, which is its own kind of idea and its own kind of movement. But it took someone like George Clinton, who I would say is a true original. You know, he is he is inventing an idea outside of not just the music, but sort of the context and, and inventing a universe for this music to live inside of in which these are the stories that get told. And I just think that that, that is, it's, it's beautiful and it's brilliant. And I think it's, it's super, super, super black. Super black. Dude, you were a super guest, man. You see how I did that? Uh, thank you, you were fantastic. Much. Thank you for being so honest, so funny, and just uh, for taking time out to come here. Now you can go home and take care of your child. Hey, there you go. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. The one and only Baron Vaughn, ladies and gentlemen. For all things Baron Vaughn, go to BaronVaughn.com. Last name spelled V-A-U-G-H-N. And if you want to find him on all social media, it's Baron Vaughn Black, spelled B-A-R-V-O-N-B-L-A-Q. Baron Vaughn Black on all social media. Check him out on Mystery Science Theater 3000 on Netflix. Check him out on Grace and Frankie on Netflix. But most importantly, guys, The New Negroes is coming to Comedy Central April 19th. It will also be simulcast on BET as well. Watch it, guys. It is fantastic. It's a mix of stand-up, sketch, and music. Baron and a great MC named Open Mike Eagle created something very incredible, and I want you guys to see it. So watch it April 19th. I'll also be posting his mixtape track listing link. You guys know that they're doing this, right? Every guest that we have on this show is making a mixtape for all of you. Jim Jeffries made a mixtape. Bill Burr made a mixtape. Fortune Feimster made a mixtape. Sal Volcano made a mixtape. Michael Rappaport. Everybody. I tell them, I'm like, make a mixtape like you're making it for a friend that shows the music that you like. And that's the point, man. Because I want you guys to get everything that you can possibly get out of this podcast. So check out Baron Vaughn and all the rest of the 500 guests mixtapes on our website. Go to the500podcast.com. If you want to email me, email the podcast. Do it at 500podcast at gmail.com. Follow me on all social media at Josh Adam Myers and go to my website that I haven't updated in a long time because I'm just updating this website, joshadammyers.com. Also, guys, follow my head writer on this show, DJ Morty Coyle. Check out him and his daughter singing many songs from the 500 on their Instagram at B and Daddy Cartoons. Also, listen to his podcast with my rabbi called Yid Nation. Twitter, it's at DJ Morty Coyle. Don't forget, guys, to sign up for the 500 Club. That's our Patreon. You can find it at the 500 podcastcom backslash club. We give you the podcast the day early. We've got some merch for you guys. Also, you get the full episode. Baron and I tape for almost three hours. It's all good. It's like all the podcast is good. The problem is we don't want to put out a three-hour podcast because we just we're, that might scare people. So what I'm telling you guys is if, if you want the full episodes, if this is your shit, Join the 500podcast.com. Also, guys, I'll be at Moon Tower Comedy Festival, guys, in Austin, Texas, and I am doing a live 500 taping. Now, we just listened to Funkadelic from 1971. Now, here is an artist that is directly influenced by this album. And guess what, guys? We have two submissions from the fans. We got two of them. And guess what? We're going to play both songs. Because if you send in your music, I don't give a fuck. If we get 30 songs for every fucking submission for every artist, we are going to play it because I want to help you guys out. So here we go. From Portland, Oregon, this is Mosca Ross. And the name of this song is El Moran. And from Paso Robles, it's Jack McHugh. 
with Bay City Blues. That's fucking dope, man. Two people sending in their songs. Guess what? I'm playing them because I'm trying to make careers blow up. If you guys are in a band and were directly influenced by one of these albums or artists that we have up on this list and you want your music featured at the end of the 500, send your song to 500podcast at gmail.com and make sure you put the album and the artist that influenced you in the subject. Next week is Loretta Lynn Week with her 2002 compilation, All Time Greatest Hits. Also, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you really want to make this, this episode count even better, Dude, watch Coal Miner's Daughter. I've done both. I listened to the greatest hits, and I've watched Coal Miner's Daughter. Cried through both of them. Be a part of the movement, guys. Y'all got some homework to do. Stay motherfucking fleecy. Stay away.